Hello, everybody. Uh, you are listening to Through Time and Clades, and I am Albert. And I'm Joan. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yes, so welcome back. Uh, today we are continuing our series, uh, Dinosaurs, the Second Chapter, which is about the evolution of modern type birds. Um, but uh, before we get started, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I've just been, you know, busy working on our series, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh, so yeah plenty of more material to come <laughs> um as for me uh i've been uh, very busy this week um, in addition to preparing for this show i had a lot of things to work on and on top of course my usual research i'm doing um yeah but unfortunately i, I can't really talk about most of those projects in public yet so uh you'll have to wait until some later date probably um before i announce them but uh yeah in any case uh, i've just yeah just been completely, <laughs> completely swamped this week with, with stuff to do. But nonetheless, uh, I think, uh, you know, talking about these birds will be a nice way to wind down the week for me. Um, and uh, I imagine it'll hopefully be a pleasant time for you as well. <laughs> now, yeah, I think so. It's a fascinating groups here. Yeah, yeah. We are, we're going to talk about a very, um, um, well, of course, I think all birds are interesting. I, I keep saying this, but <laughs> uh, we're, we're going to be talking about some some very interesting groups here, and I think um, some groups that have featured very heavily in uh, you know human perception in in many ways. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, birds of prey or raptors, or at least some of the groups of raptors. Uh, well, we'll get to like which groups count as raptors in a moment, but um, you know, most birds alive today to some extent are predatory animals they you know hunt and eat other animals for food um but when we think about uh, birds of prey the term birds of prey specifically we're usually thinking about um, birds that go after relatively large animals uh, often other vertebrates um, and birds with strongly hooked sharp talons and hooked beaks that they can use to tear flesh apart um, and in many cases these are some of the apex predators in their ecosystems um, so we're thinking about things like hawks and eagles and owls and falcons um, and they are definitely very impressive birds in many ways. Um, and in some ways, I guess it is um, not a huge surprise that birds would evolve into such an ecological niche where they're taking on quite sizable prey items um, and you know hunting them down. Because uh, after all, they are members of the theropod dinosaurs, which um, include most, if not all, of the meat-eating dinosaurs that have ever lived. Um, so ancestrally, they come from you know a long line of descent of a predatory animals and um you know there there's some um there's some uncertainty um about kind of dietary habits uh the evolution of dietary habits within the theropods because we then go through uh groups like the manoraptoriforms which include birds um and during the cretaceous manoraptoriforms include a lot of um omnivorous or herbivorous um, theropods that kind of evolve away from a um, hyper carnivorous diet. Um, so it seems that the ancestors of birds probably went through a phase where uh, they were probably not primarily feeding on other vertebrates. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't long before they did evolve back into niches like that, um, especially after the um, uh, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction when we probably had this big radiation of neoavians and among the neoavians we got some of these um you know hypercarnivorous predators um in fact in the past couple episodes we talked about you know some uh, a large number of aquatic uh, predatory birds that hunt fish so they are vertebrate hunters um and today we are going to start talking about some of um, the major groups of birds that have adapted to hunting vertebrates on land mostly um but uh, I guess before we get started, we need to decide, uh, you know, what is a raptor anyway? So uh, let's go to the next slide to introduce that concept. So like I mentioned earlier, um, most birds alive today are predatory to, to some extent. Like even if they're just eating insects or worms or something, like there's an American robin pictured here, uh, they're still eating other animals, so they are predators. But um, very few people would consider, I mean, pro probably no one would consider an American robin a raptor or a bird of prey. Um, so, you know, what, what is a bird of prey anyway? So maybe we can limit that to only vertebrate eating birds. And so the term raptorial um, in this context is often used to mean vertebrate eating birds, primarily vertebrate eating birds. Um, 
uh, well, we we could consider that. Um, but of course, then you think about uh, some the ones we talked about recently, uh, like aquatic birds, like uh, penguins and herons and pelicans, um, and cormorants. Like they they are vertebrate eating birds. They feed a lot on fish. Um, at least many of the species do. And but uh, most of the time, they're they're not typically considered raptors either. Um, incidentally, the term raptorial um, is also sometimes applied to. Um, of all things, uh, whales that hunt other vertebrates. So uh, you can read uh, papers about um, raptorial sperm whales, which are the, these extinct um, sperm whales that primarily hunted, um, you know, probably other whales um, and large fish and things like that, instead of uh, mostly eating squid like the sperm whales alive today do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting that the, the term raptorial has been applied to such different groups of animals um, and not not much so much to you know any other groups oddly enough um, uh, at least among vertebrates so yeah that's kind of odd okay uh well then people will say okay well we can define raptors based on um kind of anatomical features so not only are they feeding mostly on vertebrates but uh, they also have hooked beaks and sharp talons uh, so this should tell us what a raptor is um and yeah, I, I think in the general concept, um, this works out fairly well. Um, however, then you can also think about things like skuas. Uh, skuas are a type of shorebird. We talked about them in the shorebird episode. And they have hooked beaks and they have sharp talons and they, they hunt other vertebrates. Um, but most of the time, if you look you know, at books or papers or articles about raptors, uh, skuas are not usually included as members of of that assemblage so hmm well what's the deal there and um i think if you go very traditional uh, in traditional texts about raptors uh, they'll even specify that it is only the diurnal raptorial birds with hooked beaks and sharp talons that count as raptors so they are excluding owls from from that um, uh, definition um, now increasingly i think this is becoming much rarer i think most people today when they use the term raptor would include owls but yeah, if you, if you go to some of the older texts, they'll, they'll say things like sometimes owls count or or like uh, uh, owls are the nocturnal counterparts to the raptors or things like that. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a disparity there. And also, how about vultures? Because vultures don't typically hunt much. I mean, some species will hunt a little bit some of the time, but most of their food uh, comes from scavenging uh, animals that are already dead. Um, but they're kind of hawk-like, and they have hooked beaks. Um, they, they don't tend to have very um, strong grasping feet for catching prey, because they, they don't need to, but uh, they, they do have hooked beaks to tear through flesh and things like that while they're feeding. Um, and as we shall see, uh, contrary to some claims you might hear elsewhere, uh, vultures are generally pretty closely related to hawks and eagles. So do, do they count as raptors or not? Hmm. And uh, people will differ on this point. And then you might say, well, okay, why, why does this matter anyway? Just, just let everybody use their own personal definition of raptor. And then, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm typically, you know, uh, okay with people uh, using different definitions for, for things if they make it clear what definition they're using. Um, but you, you have situations where, where it can be uh, very important to um, define very clearly what a raptor is. For example, there are a number of conservation organizations that are dedicated to um, conserving raptors specifically. And so they have to decide what they think is a raptor and what isn't. Um, we know that a lot of the vultures are critically endangered, and we'll talk a little bit about that, or I intend to, in this episode. Um, so, of course, they, they clearly deserve conservation attention, but uh, should these raptor organizations be doing that job, you know, uh, they they need to uh, decide whether or not vultures count under their uh, under the scope of their um, of their activities. So yeah, you can see um, a lot of varying definitions of raptors or potential definitions that we could apply. Um, now, recently, uh, a review paper came out that decided to um, to propose a definition of raptor that includes um, ecological aspects of these birds and also anatomical aspects and also phylogenetic aspects of these birds. Um, and I, I think um, the definition they came up with is a pretty reasonable one. 
Um, so I'll get to that in a few slides, but uh, before we continue, uh, do you have anything else to uh, add about this general subject? <laughs> well, it certainly is a, an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would agree with you that uh, I think as long as people like make it clear like what they're talking about, mm -hmm. then I, I can see how the definition of Raptor can, can shift right. to anyone's personal preference. Uh, talking about Raptor organizations, I do know the Carolina Raptor Center uh -huh. uh, in North Carolina that I've had the fortune of going to. Um, it's just they do you know predatory birds mostly across the board. Yeah. So they have owls and vultures as well as the the typical, I guess, day living mm -hmm. eagles and hawks and stuff. And, yeah. And so I guess the, their definition is very broad in that context. Right. Right. So like the, the primarily raptorial birds with the hooked beaks and the sharp talons. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, I do definitely remember growing up with some books that would like kind of use different definitions of raptor. Um, like one, one of my favorites was the birds of prey that hunt by day. Right. And <laughs> they, they just, you know, talked about eagles and hawks and vultures mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but yeah, I guess nowadays uh, I don't really have, a, I don't really have a, a preferential definition mm -hmm. um, mm. I, I tend to mo more focus on like evolutionary relationships right. more than because I, I i would tend to think that a term like raptor is probably more of an ecological based definition That's than right. an evolutionary based definition mm -hmm. mm. yep that is that is true um uh you know it, it has been understood for a time although although we haven't known until quite recently exactly how these groups are related and to to an extent we are still uncertain as we shall see um but uh it has been acknowledged for a time that um it is quite possible that not all of the birds that are typically considered raptors uh, form a clade exclusive to themselves and don't then exclude everything that we don't consider raptors um and this has basically been, been confirmed by genetic studies um, that uh, it seems that the kind of the raptor ecomorphotype is uh, is kind of scattered across uh, the tree of birds and uh, or at least uh, one particular group in the tree of birds and uh, is not uh, they don't form a, a clade of raptors. So, yeah, the term raptor is definitely uh, mostly an ecology based or uh, to some extent, anatomically based um, term, uh, and less so of a um, phylogenetic one. Although the um, the new definition proposed by the recent paper does include a phylogenetic component to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get there. Um, and I, I guess while we're here, uh, of course, uh, if you are a fan of Mesozoic dinosaurs, uh, you also probably <laughs> also um, use the term raptor in a different sense too, uh, to uh, for the um, the dromaeosaurid uh, dinosaurs. Uh, in the Mesozoic, and sometimes the Troodontids as well, which are probably closely related. Uh, at least they're, they're closely related to both the uh, dromaeosaurids and birds. Um, and uh, this was a, this is kind of a term I think it was probably made popular by Jurassic Park, which used uh, um, the term raptor as a, as a nickname for, for dromaeosaurids. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's kind of spread, uh, permeated throughout popular culture. And so today, when you speak of raptors, uh, some people might not immediately think of the, the modern day birds, but instead of the Mesozoic dinosaurs. Um, now, uh, I, I think a uh, paleontologist reaction to, to this has been mixed. I, I know um, some people who really dislike using the term raptor for uh, Mesozoic dinosaurs. Um, I, I personally don't have a huge problem with it um, I, because after all, dromaeosaurids and troodontid dinosaurs uh, are very closely related to, to modern birds. They, they, they are both um, Paravian theropods and uh, like the modern day raptors that we often, uh, or rather, like the modern day birds that we often consider raptors, uh, they seem to have hunted and killed prey with you know sharp talons on on their feet and so on. So um, I, I think um, to an extent, uh, they they are in some ways comparable um, to to our modern day raptors, even if even though if they are there are still of course some major differences. Like the, the Mesozoic ones have teeth, and uh, most of them didn't fly and so on. But you know. I, I I think um I think it's justifiable to to call um to call them raptors uh in a broad sense um but um I I also do like the definition that the new um that the new paper came up with 
um, which uh, which is largely pertinent to, to modern birds. And um, for the record, you know, the term raptor has been used for the modern birds for far longer than it has for um, for dromaeosaurids. So definitely the, the original uh, definition, you could say, of raptor is specific to, to the modern birds. Um, but uh, before we get to this, uh, what this new definition of raptor is anyway, um, uh, we need to introduce a group of birds, a clade of birds. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the group Telleraves. And uh, this group is uh, kind of an important milestone in this series, because um, if you remember all the way back to um, episode four, when I first introduced neo -Aves, and I was talking about how neo -Avian phylogeny is a total mess, and we can't really figure out how the different major groups are related to each other. But um, here are like, um, I think, nine or so major groups that all of the major studies agree actually exist. And, well, Telleraves is the last one we haven't covered yet. So uh, this is the last <laughs> of the major um, you know, groups in that neo-avian polytomy I introduced but way back when. Um, so yeah, we're finally here. Uh, all the birds in this episode that we're going to talk about are members of Telleraves, and all the birds that we're going to talk about in future episodes of this series um, are members of Telleraves. Now, in case you think that this means the series is almost over, uh, uh, not quite. Uh, we still have a little bit of ways to go. Because <laughs> uh, as you can see, uh, right on this slide here, there are over 8,000 living species of Telleravians. So uh, they're, they're, it'll still take a few more episodes for us to get through the major groups of these guys. Yeah, they are incredibly diverse. Um, there are identifiable fossils of Telleravians from the Paleocene onwards, so they clearly originated very soon uh, after the KPG extinction. Um, and uh, something quite interesting about Telleravies. So Telleravies, the name Telleravies basically means land birds, and so sometimes a nickname for these guys is core land birds. So they, they don't include all the land living birds, but they include a great diversity of them, so they're the core land birds. Um, but um, I think even more specifically, a lot of the um, Telleravian groups are adapted to living in trees, and that, that's really um, notable um, because it is thought that uh, probably the ancestral crown birds were primarily ground-dwelling birds. Now, they, they could fly, and they may, maybe they could fly into a tree to sleep for the night like a lot of the galliforms, the chicken-like birds do, um, but uh, it seems that they were primarily foraging and nesting on the ground. But uh, within Telleravians, um, we see a great radiation of tree-dwelling dinosaurs. Now, they're, they're not the only group of birds to uh, evolve tree-dwelling forms, um, not the only group of uh, crown birds, for that matter. Um, like, uh, for example, we saw the cuckoos and the turricos uh, way, way back in episode four. Uh, some of the members of uh, Strysores live in trees. That was episode five, I think. Um, so there, there have been other groups of um, you know, tree-dwelling birds that have evolved, but by far the most diverse has to be Telleravies. Um, and so much like how the big um, water bird clade kind of um, exemplifies the, um, the dinosaurian and conquest of the ocean and of, of um, aquatic environments, um, I, I think Telleravies can be seen as kind of the dinosaurian conquest of the trees, um, because they are uh, by far the most um, diverse arboreal dinosaurs that we know of. Um, it seems that um, prior to the origin of um, at least um, avian flight, um, it doesn't seem like there are that many um, convincing arboreal uh, dinosaurs. Um, it, it seems like it, it really was a flight that kind of allowed them to unlock this kind of ecology to, to get into the trees and become specialized uh, tree-dwelling forms. There, there are some possible exceptions to that, but they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of controversial. There, there are some uh, uh, non-avial um, dinosaurs people think might be arboreal. But uh, yeah, for the most part, we don't see very clear specializations of arboreality until we get into um, dinosaurs that can actually fly. And um, of course, um, things like the opposite birds, the Enantiornithians, they, they died out at the end of the Cretaceous, leaving only the uh, ancestrally ground-dwelling crown group birds, um, and which quickly uh, radiated into a bunch of arboreal forms. Um, after the forests had regrown uh, from the impact and uh, eventually giving us uh, this super diverse group of uh, Telleravians, um, which might have, you know, they, they might have even evolved uh, arboreality several times within this group, but uh, it's not clear because uh, we, we don't have a good handle on the ancestral um, condition in, in this group. Nonetheless, uh, you know, a great majority of uh, tree dwelling birds that are around today are Telleravians. They are incredibly diverse in their ecology. But something interesting is that they might be 
ancestrally raptorial. It might be ancestrally vertebrate hunting birds. Huh. That's interesting. Um, why do we think this? Well, um, I guess to, to know that, we have to go to the next slide and see uh, who are the major groups um, in this uh, in, in Teleraves. But um, before we move on, uh, I'll just point out on, on the slide here, we have a, a hawk um, hunting another Teleravian, a uh, starling, um, in a tree. So uh, that, that's why I picked uh, this particular image for, for this slide. So, um, on the next slide, we'll meet uh, some of the major groups of um, Teleravians, or at least a very simplified uh, overview of the major groups, because you can split these many of these groups into even more, uh, even finer divisions. Uh, but still, I, I think this will do for uh, this episode. Um, so, let's see who we have here. So, we have New World Vultures, and I specify New World Vultures, because uh, New World Vultures don't form a clade with the Old World Vultures that exclude anything we don't call a vulture. So, they are... Um, uh, convergently evolved um, this kind of vulturine lifestyle um, and uh, they are actually closely related to the accipit reforms um, which include uh, not only old world vultures but also um, hawks and eagles um, and a bunch of other groups we'll get into more detail later um, which include a, a large diversity of the diurnal um, raptors um, owls are members of this group, and they of course represent kind of the nocturnal contingent of uh, what we call raptors. Um, next we have uh, Caracimorphs. Uh, Caracimorphs um, are a very diverse group, um, but uh, I think for the purposes of this episode you can think of them as the kingfisher and woodpecker group. Um, so they're a group that um, includes some members that eat vertebrates, but um, probably aren't uh, ancestrally raptorial. Um, so they, they, they don't quite share a lot of the um, the raptorial adaptations like the sharp talons and hooked beaks that we see in the classic raptorial birds so they're they're considered a mostly non-raptorial group of teller avies um we have a group called the seriemas uh, which are a south american group known from only two species alive today these are these long-legged uh, mostly ground-dwelling birds so one of the one of the few exceptions to that arboreal um tendency um uh, they hunt uh, small vertebrates on the ground for the most part uh, they are able to fly but they spend most of the time on the ground um, we have the falcons, uh, which uh, classically are usually associated with the other um, diurnal raptors. But as it turns out, um, from genetic studies, uh, we now know that falcons are actually quite distantly related uh, within Teleraves to the other um, diurnal raptors, so they do not form a clade with them. And we have a long name here called uh, Sitako Passerins. Um, this is the group that includes the parrots and the songbirds, which we didn't realize were close relatives until these genetic studies but they form a clade, and so they're, they're another clade that has kind of, um, that is, is not, uh, for most part, raptorial. Um, there are some, uh, there are some uh, raptorial members in this clade, like uh, probably most infamously the Shrikes, which are a, a group of a, um, um, raptorial songbirds, um, and they, they have a very macabre way of feeding where they will impale their prey onto spikes and thorns and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> so that serves several functions. Uh, one, one of these is it allows them to store prey for later, um, so they just, they just, you know, stockpile in a thorn bush a bunch of the remains of their prey. Um, or it also allows males to kind of show off to females saying, look what a good hunter I am, I've, I collected all these prey items. Um, and in, another function it serves is that it allows them to tear open their prey items more easily um, because um, they don't have um, as powerful feet as like a, a classic kind of raptor would uh, being songbirds. So uh, they prefer to just impale their prey item on a spike and then be able to tear off flesh, uh, pieces of flesh from there. With their beak so yeah pretty uh, interesting uh interesting birds um but um uh, for most part sitako passerins are, are not raptorial species okay so um the group teleravies in general is a group that we only kind of recognize with these um, large-scale molecular studies but uh most of the you know we're pretty much all the recent uh, molecular studies um, are consistent in uh you know in terms of which groups belong to this um, this clade, which groups belong to Teleraves, uh, it's the ones that are listed here. That much is not controversial. But there still is a little bit of uncertainty about um, how these groups within Teleraves are related to each other, and that's why I've kind of put them in a polytomy here. And on the next slide, I show some of the different um, topologies that have been recovered for the relationships within this group. Um, on the um, 
leftmost side is the topology that is most commonly recovered. Um, so in this um, in this topology, Teller AV split into two groups, uh, one called Afro AVs, including the um, accipitriforms, the hawks and allies, the owls and the caracimorphs, um, all together in one clade, uh, and it's called Afro AVs because it's hypothesized that they might have originated in Africa. Um, whether that that really is the case is difficult to tell because the, the early fossil record is not good enough for us to confirm it. But uh, kind of people have hypothesized based on the distribution of the living forms that maybe this group originated in Africa. Um, and the other group uh, in Teleravis is Australavis, which includes the Seriemas and falcons and parrots and songbirds. Um, so Australavis is intended to mean a southern uh, birds because they is also hypothesized based on the distribution of living groups um, that they might have originated in the southern continents. Um, and in terms of um, the parrots and the songbirds specifically, it is often thought that they might have originated in Australia. So um, uh, that's the reason for that name. Now, Australavis is a pretty well supported group, like pretty much all of major uh, molecular studies uh, recover it. But uh, Afroavis is not so much. Um, it is it is commonly recovered. Like most of the major um, recent studies do uh, split the group this way. But uh, as was pointed out by a recent study, uh, there are some genes that indicate like a different kind of topology, a different kind of topological signal. Uh, so there are a couple of other possibilities that we can't really reject just yet. So one of these is the one in the middle. So in this um, topology, uh, Teller Avis is split between. The, uh, the vultures and hawks and eagles and their kin, uh, and then everybody else uh, on the other side. And so the owls here are still closely related to caracimorphs, um, but the, um, the, uh, uh, most of the diurnal raptors are not associated with them. Uh, and then we still have Australavis there, that, that part remains constant. Um, and then a third possibility that this new study pointed out was um, uh, maybe the owls and most of the diurnal birds of prey uh, form a clade, um, and then the group uh, splits between that clade and everybody else. And so in, in this case, we do have a clade of a um, core raptors, you could say, uh, so where most of the raptorial groups um, do group together, but not all. And so you can see here that no matter which um, topology you kind of favor, uh, it's clear that the raptorial clades don't all clade together. They, they don't all form an exclusive clade. Um, and so this is the reason that uh, it has been suggested that Teller Avis was ancestrally raptorial and, and that we simply see uh, the retainment of these raptorial features and habits in several of these different groups. And then only in the Caracimorphs and the Cetacopassarins, uh, these raptorial traits were lost. Um, that seems to be the most uh, parsimonious um, explanation of this um, uh, this distribution. But on the other hand, you know, ecologies can evolve convergently pretty easily. So I, I don't think we can completely reject the possibility that um, in, in some or even all of these cases, raptorial ecologies uh, are convergent um, and they evolved kind of from a more maybe generalist um, ancestor. Um, at the moment, the fossil record is uh, still a bit too sparse for us to tell for sure. Um, although uh, we will meet um, in some later episodes some fossil taxa that might have some bearing on this question. But even so, uh, it certainly is a very distinct possibility that Teleravis is ancestrally raptorial. And so I, I marked here the raptorial clades in red, which is a um, little bit of a spoiler, because <laughs> uh, if we move to the next slide, we can finally get back to, you know, what are raptors anyway? What did this new study that I mentioned earlier um, uh, propose should be the definition of raptor? And so McClure et al. in 2019, this is a new study I alluded to regarding the definition of raptor, they proposed that, that raptors are members of Teller Avis that retain a primarily raptorial lifestyle. So they're, they're kind of assuming here that raptoriality is the ancestral condition for, for Teller Avis, but well, you know, that, that's not an unreasonable assumption. And so all the groups that retain uh, raptorial lifestyle from that ancestor are considered raptors in their uh, context. And so this would include uh, the groups that sit here, the New World Vultures, uh, which, you know, they, they are scavengers, but they do feed primarily on vertebrate flesh, um, the Accipitriforms, the Owls, 
or the falcons, and the seriemas, which is very interesting because seriemas classically have not been considered raptors, but as they point out in the paper, uh, under their definition, there isn't really any reason to not consider them raptors. Um, they are primarily raptorial, they primarily hunt other vertebrates. Uh, they do have sharp claws and hooked beaks for killing their prey um, and tearing flesh. Um, and they are members of Teleraves that seem to have retained an ancestrally raptorial lifestyle. So uh, they propose that Seriemas should be considered raptors. Um, and uh, I have seen like various um, conservation organizations have already adopted this where they consider Seriemas to be raptors. Um, so it seems that um, this definition is already starting to be fairly um, influential. Um, I guess while I'm here, I might as well mention that Seriemas classically were considered to be um, more closely related to cranes and rails, if you remember how gruiforms used to be this kind of super um, expanded, uh, diverse group that kind mm. of got blown apart when we realized, oh, wait, not all of these things are closely related. So yeah, it turns out Seriemas are not closely related to the cranes and rails at all. Um, they're members of this Teleravian group, and they fit this definition of raptor. Um, so this definition excludes things like the shrikes I mentioned earlier, because even though they are raptorial teleravians, uh, they probably secondarily evolved this raptorial lifestyle from a non-raptorial ancestor within teleravies, and so uh, they are not considered raptors, although they can be considered kind of raptor-like in ecology, ecology and habits. Um, and furthermore, uh, McClure had also um, point out that the term birds of prey is usually considered equivalent to raptors. I, I know some people do draw a distinction between them. Like they, they'll say birds of prey refers to like all predatory birds and uh, raptors refers to like a more strict definition where it's the hooked beaks and sharp talons and all that. Um, but um, in general, it seems that the prevalent uh, usage nowadays is, is to use raptors equivalent to birds of prey. So if I say birds of prey, I, I mean raptor and, and vice versa. Um, so yeah, finally, we have this um, kind of um, uh, definition of raptor that pulls in different aspects of biology to give us a hopefully fairly consistent kind of definition. Um, they do also mention that this is meant to be a sort of generalization. Uh, there are species of, um, there are like individual species within some of these groups that aren't strictly, you know, primarily raptorial. So for example, there is a very weird kind of old world vulture called the uh, palm nut vulture, which does prey on animals sometimes, but it, uh, a big chunk of its diet consists of fruit of all things. Um, that's why it's called the palm nut <laughs> vulture because it likes to eat palm nuts. Um, but because it is, you know, kind of embedded in these primarily raptorial groups, um, in general, these these um, general groupings are still by and large raptorial. So they are they are still all considered raptors, even if there might be a few individual exceptions. So um, yeah. Um, all right, I think that's uh, that's what I have to say about defining raptors. Uh, do you have anything to add to this? I think it's funny that. Um... So I guess the palm nut vulture is like the the panda bear of of the of the raptors. <laughs> You're right, exactly. <laughs> I've uh, I've always thought that birds of prey was an interesting word. Mm -hmm. um, I know in like older works, I'm talking like Heckle, yeah, uh, like carnivorans were mm. talked about as beasts of prey. That's right, yeah. Um, but you don't really hear that anymore versus birds of prey, which has just kind of hung around for so long, which has always been interesting to me. That's um, true, yeah. I, uh, no, I'm definitely down with this definition. I mean, if this is a direction that biologists want to go, I, I'm, I'm all for it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's a pretty reasonable one. And, you know, it encompasses pretty much all the groups people generally consider to be birds of prey and excludes most of the groups that generally have not been considered birds of prey and is I think it's fairly kind of internally consistent um so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm down with it uh, if people want to use it uh, I, I think that's I think that's great uh, and provisionally I, I, I think I'll, I'll be using it uh, in the foreseeable future um so yeah so we have all these different uh, raptorial groups um they are not all each other's closest relatives, but they all belong to the group Teleraves. And so in this episode, we're going to talk about a couple of these groups, um, some of the most diverse ones, in fact. So we're going to talk about the um, the New World Vultures and the closely related um, Accipitriforms, and also the Owls. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, before we jump into specific groups, uh, I, I think it is quite interesting the role that um, raptors 
uh, often play in popular culture and you know, you know or even traditional uh, human cultures um because they're they're often like pretty conflicting uh, perceptions of birds of prey um mm. and I, I guess that's true of a lot of predatory large predatory animals um like on one hand yes uh, a lot of birds of prey are admired for you know their power and their majesty and, and all that um but uh people also come into conflict with birds of prey for other reasons too like uh, birds of prey might prey on um domestic fowl that people are trying to keep uh birds of prey might compete with humans for for prey items that they're hunting um and so in some contexts the uh, birds of prey have also been vilified as well and in, in um even in quite recent times which is rather um, rather unfortunate um and of course different groups of birds of prey have different connotations too um like people are more likely to uh, view eagles, for example, in a positive light than vultures. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. because vultures, I guess, are associated with things that are dead, even though, you know, eagles are the ones that actually kill things. So, yeah, that, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit contradictory in my opinion. But, uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, vultures, they look kind of grotesque. They are often associated with, like, dead and rotting bodies. So people often don't like them, which is um, very unfortunate. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, my defense of vultures. Um, but uh, also things like owls. Um, owls have various different connotations, too. Like, uh, they're sometimes viewed as symbols of wisdom, but uh, they're also kind of um, sometimes considered ill omens, I guess because they are nocturnal and uh, make weird noises at night. People consider them to be kind of spooky. Um, so yeah, uh, raptors have ha held a range of different uh, roles in uh, human perception over time. Um, and sometimes even the same species can occupy very different uh, such roles um, in human perception. So um, yeah, definitely uh, they're, they're a group that has um, been intimately tied to human activities um, for a long time uh, in fact for a very long time depending on how far back you want to look because we will see that interactions between uh, humans uh, or at least uh, total group humans and raptors are not a new thing by any means <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah and of course uh, if you if you've been following a jones series on the humanity um the prologue uh, you you will know what i'm talking about <laughs> but yeah let's get into some specifics now so first up we have a group <laughs> Yeah, the New World Vultures. Um, so New World Vultures are currently not a spectacularly diverse group. Uh, there are seven living species, but nonetheless, um, I think in many parts of the range, they are a very familiar group. Um, now, as their name suggests, uh, they are from the Americas, although there are possible uh, fossils from the Eocene of Europe that might belong to kind of early members of this group. So they might have had a wider form of distribution, but uh, those fossils are pretty fragmentary, so it's hard to say much about them. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the New World vultures are not like the living um, closest relatives to the vultures of the Old World. And so that's why we're spe specifying New World vultures here. Um, the, the kind of vulture ecomorph evolved several times independently um, within uh, the raptorial Telaravians. So, uh, yeah, I do want to make this clear, and I mentioned this in the um, previous episode, too. Uh, <laughs> New World vultures are not closely related to storks. Uh, that was a um, classic kind of hypothesis that seemed to make a lot of sense because there are a lot of um, anatomical and ecological similarities between the New World vultures and some of the storks, like the marabou stork, uh, which is also a kind of a bald-headed scavenging bird. And storks also, um, you know, often soar on thermals and... Um, they also, um, all, both, both the New World Vultures and Storks, uh, both uh, pee on their legs to, to keep cool. I mentioned that in the previous episode, too. Um, and uh, some of the early genetic studies even seem to support this. But we now have, you know, much more complete um, genetic sequences with much more complex methods of analyzing them. And it is very unambiguous. Storks and New World Vultures are not closely related at all. Um, People will still repeat this as a sort of kind of shocking or surprising quote unquote fact that did you know that new world vultures are you know not closely related to hawks or uh, eagles or old world vultures or more closely related to storks? Yeah, that that is not true. Uh, new world vultures are are more closely related to hawks and eagles um, and even to old world vultures than to um, storks. Um, they are just not like the extant living um, sister taxon to um, old world vultures. Um, so yes, they, they did in evolve uh, scavenging habits independently, but 
they are closely related to the other kind of most of the other diurnal raptors yeah they are not closely related to storks storks are members of the big water bird clade so yeah emphasis <laughs> on that um but uh, new world vultures they are specialized scavengers um i know like um the um the american black vulture it'll, it'll sometimes hunt live prey it'll it'll like form these big flocks and kind of gang up on like medium-sized animals um and um, you know sometimes even like helpless uh, newborn uh, livestock um, and and kill them um which is one reason why uh, uh, farmers are not fond of them um but by and large uh, new world vultures are specialized scavengers um that pretty much the vast majority of the diet is scavenged like they will very rarely if ever um, hunt live prey um and to be scavengers they um have several specialized adaptations for this um of course they are very notable for having a kind of bare head with a uh, you know very few feathers on it um and it, it is often said that uh this uh, probably helps keep the head clean while they're sticking their head deep into uh, rotting carcasses and all that um and it might function in that but um some recent studies have shown that uh the bald head probably has other uh, functional significance as well um so now there there was a study done on old world vultures but it, it probably would apply to the new world ones too uh that the bald head um also functions in thermoregulation in regulating body temperature um because these birds they often soar very high up into the sky uh where um it is it can be freezing cold up there um and so when they when this happens they will kind of retract the head uh, deep into the, their neck feathers and kind of cover up most of the bald parts of the head but when they come down towards the ground, it is often scorching hot because they are living in these um, habitats where thermals can form at midday, right? So they're often out and about at the hottest part of the day. And so, you know, once they get down to the ground, they can kind of um, extend their head and neck outwards. Uh, and so exposing a lot of their bare skin to quickly cool off. Um, and so uh, the bald head helps them deal with this kind of great disparity in the temperatures they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that, that study was primarily done on old world vultures, but I imagine it would be uh, also serving a similar function in uh, these new world species as well. And also in a lot of the um, new world vultures, the bald head is quite brightly colored. So um, I, I would imagine that it probably has some kind of social signaling function as well, even if we don't fully understand you know, exactly how that how that works. Um, if you've never seen a picture or or in, in life a um, a king vulture you should go look it up because they have the most amazing kind of head colors um yeah quite incredible um now kind of related to that i already kind of sort of mentioned this uh new world vultures are able to travel great distances by soaring um though they are excellent soars we talked about um, thermal soaring in, in the last episode when we talked about storks and uh, pelicans and some of the other uh, large birds that use this as a foraging method um so yeah they're basically um riding on these rising columns of warm air because the, when the sun has heated up the ground enough the, these columns of warm air start to form called thermals and so they ride on top of these thermals and they, they are able to soar for great distances doing this without spending much energy and so here, here's an interesting thing um this is actually one of the reasons that uh, it is you know very unlikely that <laughs> it's very unlikely that tyrannosaurus rex was a pure scavenging animal um wow. because it you know tyrannosaurus rex could not do thermal soaring i don't think i you need me to tell you that um <laughs> Uh, yeah because people often think yeah oh yeah you, you scavenge you're, you're living kind of an easy life right like you, you don't need to hunt for yourself you just pick up free meals all the time um and it is true that um pretty much you know most large carnivores uh will uh, scavenge if they get the opportunity if they happen across a carcass they, you know they might as well take it because they then that means they save energy hunting but if you want to you know um feed entirely or mostly on carcasses if you want to depend entirely on carcasses for food uh that is actually not the most energy efficient way of living if you cannot fly because it is very unpredictable where carcasses will actually show up and they're often scattered far and wide so you have to walk or you know you have to travel for uh, long distances just trying to find enough food to sustain yourself and in vultures they can do this because they can soar for massive distances on these thermals without spending a whole lot of energy but if you are a non-flying animal it is you know 
not very efficient for you to walk uh, all that long, all those long distances. So yeah, that is um, one of many reasons why Tyrannosaurus rex was almost certainly not a pure scavenging animal, contrary to what you might have heard. Um, <laughs> But uh, we do have examples of pure scavenging uh, theropods, and of course, uh, these are many of the New World vultures, and some of the Old World ones, too. Um, something uh, also quite interesting about uh, New World vultures is a lot of them have a great sense of smell. So, well, more specifically, it is a member of the genus Cathardes that have a great sense of smell, so this includes a... Um, uh, very familiar in most parts of its range, uh, the turkey vulture, um, which um, is a member of this genus. And uh, we mentioned before that kind of the, the cliche of birds not having a great sense of smell is not entirely true. Uh, in fact, uh, many birds uh, actually do have a fairly decent sense of smell, and we're only just now starting to understand uh, kind of the role that the sense of smell plays in their uh, biology and their behavior. Um, but uh, things like the turkey vulture have an exceptional sense of smell, and so they are able to find uh, carcasses from great distances without even seeing them, um, and they can find carcasses even, you know, in forested habitats where there's tree cover covering the ground and you can't actually see the ground from the sky, uh, they are still able to find uh, carcasses by smelling them. Uh, which leads to some pretty interesting ecological interactions between because um, some of the other New World vultures that don't have as good a sense of smell as turkey vultures will often follow turkey vultures uh, because they know that the turkey vultures can sense things that they can't, so they know where the good food is. <laughs> so, yep. Mm. Um, now, uh, something else, um, you know, quite notable about the New World vultures is that they include some of the largest living uh, flying birds. Uh, so things like, um, the Andean condor is one of the largest uh, flying birds in the world, and the California condor is the largest uh, bird of all in uh, North America. And, um, they can weigh up to, you know, like over 10 kilograms, like 13 kilograms, uh, maybe 15 uh, in, in large individuals. Um, so yeah, they are they are very large, uh, among the largest extant flying birds. Um, and I think the Andean condor is often cited as having the largest uh, wing area among um, uh, living flying birds. Um, so yeah, the, lo the longest uh, wingspan belongs to the, um, the wandering albatross because it has these very long and uh, narrow, sharply pointed wings. Um, and uh, the heaviest flying bird is often said to be the cory bustard, although I think um, very large as swans might be able to surpass that. Um, mm -hmm. But either way, uh, despite all that, uh, the, um, the Andean condor has the largest wing area, uh, which is of course very helpful for attaining a lot of lift um, in thermal soaring. And finally, something very unusual about um, New World vultures is that they don't have a syrinx. So the syrinx is a vocal organ that most birds use to make noises, and this is one of the reasons why birds can make these extremely complex calls. But uh, New World vultures don't have one, and so they, they don't, they're not very vocal animals. And when they do make calls, it's usually like things like guttural hisses and growling and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, pretty unusual for a bird. And I, I don't think it is clear, you know, why they lost the syrinx yeah it, it, well what the significance of that is but uh, it is something uh, um, quite odd that they that they have or rather don't have uh, among modern birds um so i have a few other things to say but uh do you, do you have anything else you want to add about new world vultures oh well i mean <laughs> I, I i i love these birds Me too. honestly I, I i think that they are uh lovely mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Like their role in ecology, of course, is super important. Yep. Mm. Um, you know, the fact that some of the species, like they can eat parts of carcasses that other scavengers can't. That's right. And um, I, I just think like they're they're cute. <laughs> There's um, like the turkey vulture. Yeah. Um, mm. Living in North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, I growing up, anytime I'd be outside, there'd always be at least one <laughs> you know, riding the thermals. And uh, so I've become quite familiar with them over the years and grown really fond of them. They're some of my favorite birds. Um, I have my stuffed one on my bed right now, actually. That's <laughs> <laughs> just great. Um, I should probably mention, I might as well just plug this because uh, for anybody who's on Facebook, there's a, um, so there's Tracy's Aviary oh, yeah. in Ohio. And they have like, an, they have an Andean condor there uh, who they call Andy in Condor, <laughs> and so uh, he kind of has his um his own Facebook page where like they post 
photos of him doing things around the park. Like he's a, he's an a, a, what is it advocacy animal or mm. something like that. Where like they he he roams around and like he's he kind of represents his species. Right, and, right, an ambassador. Like, and that, yes, that's the, the ambassador animal. And uh, of course, like every, every day, there's always photos of him. You know, you know, running around in the grass or or making a funny face or showing his wingspan off because you know <laughs> again andy and condor is impressive right impressive bird and uh I, I just, <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where it's like people think about vultures and i guess you'll probably go into this too um and and they see like the the wrinkly naked face mm-hmm. and they're scavenging and they think like no oh, what, what a hideous right thing you know how can anybody like a, a bird like this <laughs> but if you you know if you pay more attention to them and their habits and 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 you like pay attention to like Andy Condor, for example, mm-hmm. who, who and, and, like just making all these like hilarious faces and poses and stuff. Like I, I think they'll they'll grow on you too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. You know, you say don't don't judge a book by its cover, and that's often true. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm definitely with you there on the love of New World vultures because yeah, they they are among my favorite birds too, and um, I. I really love seeing um, turkey vultures. Like you know, back when I lived in the states, I, they they are of course quite common birds um, in most parts of a uh, of the United States. And uh, yeah, I I I always love seeing them just kind of flying around like effortlessly, just soaring in the air. Um, I, they are definitely very remarkable. Um, the thing is, like <laughs> you know, people are always surprised when uh, when they ask me what my favorite bird is. Of course, I can't just pick one, so I, I list a few examples. But um, <laughs> I, I I often include the turkey vulture, and they're always surprised by that. They're what the turkey vulture really? Um, but uh, but yeah, I I think um, if I were to aspire to be any kind of bird, I would like to be a turkey vulture because, well, for one thing, uh, they don't really hurt anybody else. They're pretty much entirely scavengers. Um, not not many other things bother them. It's not often that they are preyed upon by other animals. Um, like even humans don't hunt them most of the time. Um, and uh, they just kind of spend their day kind of doing their own thing. Um, and what they do is very beneficial to most of the other things in the in their environment. So um, they kind of help everybody out. And I I think you know that's that's a kind of lifestyle that I, I think a lot of us can aspire to. <laughs> oh, I hear you there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really like, I really like turkey vultures. I, I really miss them after moving here to the UK. Cause of course new old vultures are, are not found here in the wild. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they were, they were always kind of a familiar sight that I, I could count on in the U S and yeah, just incredible birds. They, they are, you know, turkey vultures are not as big as, um, uh, California condors or Andean condors, but, um, they're they're still pretty damn big birds, and uh, it, it's always a delight to, to see them uh, with their very distinctive kind of flight style, where they're rocking from side to side, and the wings kind of fell held slightly angled upwards in a V shaped uh, kind of shape. Um, and vultures are indeed very ecologically important, um, and it is very unfortunate that in many parts of the world, uh, there many vulture species are critically endangered for various reasons. And in fact, uh, some some human communities have been feeling the consequences of a lack of vultures. Um, and I, I think I'll talk about that a bit, bit more when we get to um, old world vultures, uh, because that that's um, was being affected. But very similar um, kind of factors are, are relevant uh, when it comes to new world vultures, too. Um, so like you said, uh, vultures are able to stomach uh, a lot of, you know, material in rotting carcasses that other animals cannot like eat. even other animals that will scavenge some of the time um, will often get sick from eating certain types of uh, microbes that are found in rotting carcasses but a uh, vulture's a digestive system is amazing it can just pretty much destroy and pulverize everything that goes in there um, like you can't tell um, what kind of meat a vulture has eaten from its uh, droppings, or it's very difficult at least, because the DNA from the meat that is eaten it gets completely destroyed in its digestive system. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they also destroy a lot of um, disease-bearing um, you know, pathogens in, in carcasses too. And in fact, uh, it has been found that uh, vultures have, uh, new old vultures specifically, uh, I, 
and are aware of um, equivalent studies on old world vultures, but definitely I know in new world vultures it has been found that um, the the microbiome in their digestive system is a, composed of very specific types of bacteria. And uh, these bacteria are actually the types of bacteria that you would find in rotting carcasses and would normally make um, any animal they colonized very, very sick. But uh, instead of becoming sick, the New World vultures have kind of recruited these bacteria as part of the digestive system to help them break down the, you know, the very nasty stuff they, that they like to eat. Um, so, uh, mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a very, very cool adaptation. Um, and probably these specific types of bacteria also help kind of crowd out the other types of potentially harmful bacteria that they ingest um, so that they, they don't get a foothold in there. So, yeah really really cool um and by doing this uh vultures not only clean up you know their environment of kind of dead bodies everywhere but they also kind of prevent the spread of disease that's kind of the, one of the major ways in which vultures are really ecologically important is by doing this um and if you have an environment that doesn't have a lot of vultures carcasses don't get cleaned up quick enough for uh, you know this kind of effect to take place so yeah respect the vultures because they are super important to to the environments that they live in and so yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly um did do you also get them um, uh, black vultures down there yeah i was gonna say um one of my first birding lessons uh -huh. actually um <laughs> that i learned when i was really young was to tell turkey vultures from black vultures apart mm. because when they're well i mean one thing i mean the heads like that's kind of a no-brainer the turkey vulture has like the red head the black vulture has the black head or like a gray head i guess technically um but like when they're in the air um and their wings are you know splayed out as they do yeah uh, the turkey vulture has kind of like a grayish white on the tips of the primaries that's right whereas the black vulture only has whites on the i guess the outer tips of right. the wings and so when you see one in flight, it's very easy to say, oh, that's a turkey vulture or that's a black vulture. That's right. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, I do know, I, I, I think this is true, but I, I haven't been able to check. But I think the black vulture is more common the further you go south. I think so, yeah. In the United States. Right. Because um, I know in, whenever I visit folks in Florida, I would see more black vultures mm. <laughs> than turkey vultures right. versus here where it's usually the other way around. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Yes, um, and I, I when I was in, in Maryland, it definitely fit that pattern too. I, I, I would see both species, but uh, turkey vulture was more common. Um, and yeah, they they also kind of fly differently too. So the kind of rocking from side to side, that kind of motion is is more specific to the um, the turkey vulture, whereas the um, the um, black vulture kind of soars with its wings flat and uh, without the kind of rocking. Um, so that that's also a good way to tell them apart. Um, yeah, they're definitely really cool. Um, unfortunately, um, so there, there was one time I went to um, uh, Arizona on a uh, field course, um, uh, and it was great. We visited the Grand Canyon and all that, and you know, super super fun. But the one disappointment that I left with it was I did not get to see California condor <laughs> on that trip. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I um, I am just I have always been fascinated by the conservation mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. of the california condor right um and like more and more like the situation has been improving yep mm. like i think like just a few weeks ago um the yurok tribe or the yurok nation i should say um was working with the uh, the conservationists of the california condor mm -hmm. in california and they're planning on reintroducing that species to the redwood forest yeah hmm. um cool. for the first time in like 100 years or something wow and uh i i often wonder you know we talk about like you know the 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 effects of vulture loss mm -hmm. in in like eurasia and africa yep. hmm. um, but I, I often think about like you know what sorts of benefits would come if there were more california condors mm -hmm. in western north america yeah that's a that's a good question. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. But um, you know, uh, restoring a major scavenger to its former ecosystem, I, I think, you know, it, it's quite likely to have um, quite strong benefits in the long run. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I guess the situation is a little bit different mm -hmm. nowadays. Right. I, I know, uh, there's a convoluted like 
ecological history of the West Coast with yes. the California con. Oh, like yes. they they would go after you know the megafauna, you know mammoths and bison and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but then once those died out, I, I think they switched to more coastal animals. Yeah, that's like correct. That. Yeah, they started like, scavenging on whales and seals. Right, and then once Europeans started mm -hmm. showing up, bringing their cattle right. and, and horses and stuff, then they switched again. That's right. Going after them, um, at which point you know afterwards, like they were you know mercilessly hunted and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, unfortunately, and they were all round up and and put into the breeding programs. Right. And, yeah, it's just slow because I, I I think these these birds breed very slowly. They do, yeah. It's like one or two babies at a time. Or right, something. right. Um, and I'm always, uh, of course, growing up, I could never, you know, read about conservation without seeing the little California <laughs> condor puppets that they would use that's to right. <laughs> feed the babies in their in their little enclosures. Right. Um, that's that's iconic with me. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> and it makes me think about the, like the, that 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 level of dedication towards preserving these mm -hmm. birds because mm -hmm. you know. To, to make sure that like no no wild behaviors i guess quote unquote are are lost right and, and they're able to kind of keep the general ecology as best as they can um of course the one downside of the conservation movement and i remember learning about this like a, a, not too long ago was that i guess when they were taking all these california condors in and they were like you know making sure that they were free of disease and, mm. and, and they would sterilize them and that kind of thing you know oh, clean yeah. them up I guess they had wiped out their lice. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like they had like their own lice species that would, you know, do their thing. That's right. Um, but with all the cleanup, you know, the lice had nowhere else to go and they went extinct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> kind yeah of, that's uh, a huge discourse. Indeed. Of parasite indeed. conservation. Parasite conservation. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, that, that that's a great overview, and that means I won't have to go into that much detail in a moment, because, uh, um, I, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, but no, you're you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right about the kind of uh, general um, timeline of, of how things how things went in that regard. Um, and so yeah, originally um, California condors could be found like you know back back in the Pleistocene they could be found like across North America pretty much. Um, but after the die out of the megafauna, they uh, ended up switching to um, coastal um, megafauna. Okay, so die out of land megafauna, they ended up switching to uh, eating um, remains of whales and seals on the coast, and that's why they became restricted to the west coast. Um, but then, uh, yeah, when Europeans brought cattle over, uh, that's when they started scavenging on livestock. And yeah, unfortunately, they they were often deliberately killed, uh, even though they are they don't hunt uh, livestock; they're only scavengers. Um, and furthermore, they also um, get killed a lot by um, ingesting lead because um, lead pellets that are used in hunting. Of course, um, when condors scavenge on dead bodies that um, had these lead pellets in them, they would get poisoned by the lead, and that would kill mm. them. Um, and that is that is one of the major reasons why their numbers dwindled so so much but uh fortunately yeah they, they are making a comeback and so far it's uh, been quite successful um and hopefully that program can can continue and we can still have these very magnificent animals still with us now uh if we go to the um next slide uh we'll see that in fact um there used to be a huge diversity of New World vultures around uh, in the in the Americas in general. So what this um, um, image is showing here is uh, some examples of living uh, New World vultures. So the the ones in black and white, but also uh, their close relatives from the Pleistocene. Um, some of these are from North America, some are from uh, South America. Uh, but you can see that there used to be this whole range of sizes. Um, in the, this kind of scavenging guild, uh, like all of these different scavengers um, sharing, in many cases, uh, overlapping in, in range, um, and uh, just all scavenging from megafauna. And, you know, it would have been amazing to see, like, how they all interacted ecologically. Like, well, what was, like, you know, kind of the pecking order? What, what was the pecking order? Like, who, who would feed first and so on? Uh, like, or were there some that specialize on feeding on specific uh, parts of bodies or, um, you know, specific types of animals? Uh, like, I, I, would love, I, would, I would love to know that. Um, 
yeah, certainly today there is a very complex kind of hierarchy in the coexisting vulture species where uh, some will feed first, uh, because they're more aggressive or bigger or whatever, uh, and they will feed different species will feed on different parts of bodies and yeah, they'll kind of partition out their niches like that. Um, and back in the Pleistocene, let's say in um, uh, in California, for example, where you have the La Brea tar pits, uh, you get you have of course the turkey vulture, but you also have the California condor, and you also have um, a, a larger relative of the uh, modern black vultures, uh, Corygips occidentalis, is the extinct species that was a little bigger than the modern one. Um, you also had a uh, Brea gyps. Um, and you had uh, other members of the genus uh, Gymnogyps, which is um, uh, the genus of California condor. And um, not only not only that, but you also had uh, some of the quote unquote old world vultures uh, that lived around in the, near the La Brea tarp at the time. We'll get to those later. But uh, yeah, this huge range of scavenging birds, like all living in the same ecosystem. Um, but uh, it seems that with the die out of the megafauna, a lot of them went with them. Um, now, fortunately, we do still have some that are alive today. Of course, the uh, turkey vultures and black vultures are doing quite well. Um, and the California condor, because it uh, seems to have been uh, rather flexible in its uh, dietary habits, uh, it was able to, to hang on for some time, too, uh, by eating uh, you know, marine um, food sources. Um, but, and it wasn't really until the, um, the Europeans came with their lead shot and you know, deliberate um, killing that uh, that California condors got into some real dire straits. So um, yeah, a little bit of an um, interesting uh, record of the kind of megafaunal turnover reflected in the um, scavenging avian diversity. Um, if we go a little bit further back in time on the next slide, um, so this is this figure is from a paper that came out literally today. Like, yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> Like I finished the presentation and everything, and then this new paper came out. It's, uh, okay, so uh, this is not a not a new species. This is a species that was already named, but they described uh, some new remains from this um, um, extinct New World vulture called Dryornis from the Pliocene of Argentina. And um, it turns out um, they actually ran a phylogenetic analysis on this uh, on this vulture, um, which is pretty interesting because um, phylogenetic analyses of uh, that include fossil members of uh, most raptor groups are basically non-existent for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know why none of the people who have worked on uh, um, fossil raptors seem to run phylogenetic analyses on them. But yeah, like they're super rare. Uh, they they hardly exist. Um, so I was really excited to see that this study actually had a phylogenetic analysis, including this species. Um, and so they found that Dryornis is actually more closely related to the smaller species of newer vultures, like the like the turkey vulture and the black vulture, and less closely related to the uh, the ones we call condors. Um, which is interesting because it turns out that Dryornis is much bigger than any of the living New World vultures, like even the condors. They estimated, <laughs> they estimated it as, as weighing up to like 26 kilograms, which is absolutely gigantic wow. for a flying bird. Yeah, yeah, like holy crap. <laughs> what a sight that would have been to see. Um, yeah, and there there are, there are some other kind of um, new old vulture fossils that are known from like the, the Miocene, like but all of them from the Americas. Um, the the only exceptions are like the very early fragmentary forms I mentioned from the Eocene of Europe. Um, but in any case, it seems that new old vultures have been doing their thing for a very long time. Um, do you have anything else to add about them? Um, not particularly, no. All right. Well, uh, then we can move on to the next group. And the next group is a completely extinct group that is also from the Americas, and in some ways are very similar to the New World vultures. And these are the Teratornithids, uh, often called the Teratorns from sh for short. Um, now they are a completely extinct group. They died out in the Pleistocene, and so they were also kind of the part of the big guild of um, gigantic raptors that were around in the Pleistocene in the Americas. Like, I, I, it's it's mind boggling to think about because. Like, you know, North America is not bad for raptor diversity to today, right? Like, I've seen, like, many species of yeah. raptors in North America. But, like, gosh, like, if you go back to the Pleistocene, there were even more. And and many of them were, like, freaking gigantic species. And it was just, like, wow. Like, like how... It really shows, like, how impoverished, like, our, our modern-day ecosystems are. Like, 
Yeah, like I can barely imagine an ecosystem with so many species of gigantic predatory birds around, um, uh, or carnivorous um, uh, raptorial birds at least. Um, now, the earliest teratornithids are currently known from the Oligocene, but yeah, their their fossils are pretty much found um, from from then onwards up, up into the Pleistocene. Um, now, in popular depictions, uh, teratorns are often depicted very similarly to New World vultures. Um, but there are some features of their anatomy that seem to suggest that they weren't quite just like scaled up uh, giant vultures. Um, uh, they might not have been like as specialized scavengers like uh, New World vultures are today. Um, for example, the structure of their beaks. Um, so in, um, in New World vultures, the upper and lower jaws uh, kind of uh, meet the edges of the upper and lower jaws kind of meet together so the tips kind of touch each other. So this helps them like kind of cut off pieces of flesh to eat when they're scavenging with carcasses. But um, but in teratorns, the um, the edges of the upper and lower jaws kind of slide past each other, more like scissors. Um, and so this is less effective for tearing off um, flesh from a big carcass, but it is uh, more effective for grabbing onto a living struggling prey item and kind of, you know, clamping it between the jaws and preventing it from escaping. So some people have suggested that uh, teratorns probably were not actually uh, specialized scavengers, but were primarily predatory birds that were going after prey that they were able to swallow whole. And, you know, being so big, something they could swallow whole would be a fairly sizable prey item, uh, like, you know, a rabbit or something like that. Um, now, um, also unlike um, New World vultures, uh, Teratorns were a lot more robustly built, especially their hind limbs were very robust, so they seemed to have been very good at walking around on the ground. Um, like, you know, New World vultures, of course, will land on the ground to feed, but they, they don't, you know, do that much kind of striding and, and walking places. Um, but it seems that Teratorns might have, so they might have, like, spent a lot of time just walking around on the ground, uh, seeing what they could find to eat, and, you know, grabbing live prey, maybe opportunistically scavenging, but not primarily scavenging. Um, so, yeah, quite quite a different very image from how they're often portrayed. And Teratorns were probably the most massive known flying birds. So the largest species is Argentavis from the Miocene of Argentina. Um, now, it, it is not is known from like pretty fragmentary remains but based on them it has been estimated that is it might have weighed up to like 70 kilograms which is huge like that is like ostrich size <laughs> uh, and so it is remarkable that an animal like that could fly or a bird like that could fly at least um in terms of its wingspan, it, the latest estimates suggest that uh, Argentavis had a wingspan of about 5 meters, which is a bit downscaled from some of the earlier assumptions, which put it like 6 or 7 meters. But yeah, 5 meters seems about right based on um, the, the latest estimates. Um, so they weren't the flying birds with the largest known wingspan ever, because those were the Pelagornithids, which we talked back about um, in episode three, I think. Um, so those guys had much larger wingspans than even the large teratorns, but um, it seems that Argentavis, if this 70 kilogram estimate is correct, would have outweighed the Pelagornithids by a lot. So they were still the largest of flying birds in a sense. And even, you know, a relatively like kind of average um, teratorn, like uh, teratornis, uh, is as big as or larger than the largest uh, condors alive today. So these were yeah, definitely huge birds. Um, in general, teratorns have been uh, assumed to be closely related to uh, cathartids, so to New World vultures. Um, and they do share a number of skeletal s similarities. But um, teratorns have, oddly enough, never been included in a phylogenetic analysis. Um, so like I said, like <laughs> people who work on fossil raptors apparently just don't run phylogenetic analyses. I don't, I don't get it. Um, um, but yeah, like they, they haven't been included in, in an analysis. So um, it, it hasn't been like kind of um, empirically uh, supported that they are closely related to newer vultures. They're just kind of assumed to, to be. So yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. It would not surprise me if they were indeed closely related. But yeah, I, I think uh, a phylogenetic analysis of raptorial birds, including fossil forms, is something we really, really need right now. Um, do you have anything else to add about this interesting group? Yeah, I, I think it is funny, like this this association with New World vultures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, like, like it's almost like assumed that oh, they they kind of look like you know turkey vultures and condors. Right. So then, 
they, they not only were they probably related to them, but they probably lived like them too. Right. Um, probably looked like them too, because I'm, I'm even seeing the photo that yeah. you included the, that reconstruction. That's that, right. That, that's a very vulture territory. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. <laughs> complete little white thing. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's funny how. Yeah, like growing up, like I, I never really question that mm-hmm. yeah it, it was just so like you like you had your your typical reconstruction of a tar pit you know with some struggling but you know bison and mammoths and right. then there's the dire wolves fighting with the safe tooth cats and always in the background right or the territorians just you know punching around and waiting for their chance to get in and i've just <laughs> like that's been around since like charles knight yeah that's right um, yeah <laughs> so to kind of like learn this so recently that you know these birds were probably like most likely maybe not have been very vulture like at all yeah um, even as far as like their ecology goes um this is something i have to keep like internalizing yeah yeah uh, totally <laughs> forward um, yeah but yeah amazing birds i mean argentavis like oh that that's a yeah to have seen that in person right and, and like what, what would it even be doing in its environment like yeah if it was like a if it was it wasn't a scavenger right what, what was it hunting <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah that's a great question i wish we could find more uh, complete remains of it sometime um yeah that, like um it, you know it's not even clear like how well it could fly because we, we do have some like arm bones from it but we don't have like a complete wing or anything and um a five meter wingspan is, is certainly big in absolute terms but for a 70 kilogram bird it, it would be a bit on the small side so some people actually have suggested that it would it had like relatively reduced flight capabilities compared to other territories um <clears throat> which would be quite interesting um so yeah you know uh, i hope we find a more complete specimen someday uh, that would be amazing i guess my question is like what would that compare with like as dark and pterosaurs <laughs> mm. That's a great question. Yeah, of course, as Darchids, um, like if any listeners are not aware, um, included the largest known pterosaurs. And uh, it is currently thought that their primary ecology was mostly walking on the ground and kind of picking prey items up uh, from the ground, um, even though they, they could fly perfectly well. Um, it, it seems that they were primarily like kind of the, the hypothesis is called the terrestrial stalker hypothesis. Um, and uh, that was primarily how they fed. Um, you know, you know what? I, I think that might not be a terrible comparison um, to what Territorns might have been doing, um, walking around on the ground. These giant flying animals that were able to fly, but were mostly foraging by by walking and then picking up prey items. That's not crazy, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it would be interesting to see like some you know detailed kind of anatomical comparison between them or something like that. For sure. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, definitely a very interesting group of birds. I, I think um, they're, they're oddly understudied, I think. Like, there, there aren't a whole lot of recent papers about pteratorns. Like, there are some, but, you know, there, there's, there hasn't been, like, you know, big papers, like, overviewing, like, the many specimens or, like, reviewing all the species or, you know, again, putting them in the phylogenetic analysis or anything like that. Um, like, even the, even the, you know, studies I'm talking about where I'm talking about their lifestyle, those are papers from the 1980s. Like, uh, yeah, like, like, in recent times, they haven't received that much attention, which is really odd because, you know, they're, they're such spe- spectacular birds. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> hopefully that changes sometime because definitely there, there are a lot of um, uh, grad student projects that could be, that could be done on territories for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So... Let's continue onward and move on to the accipitra forms. Um, all right, so um, because uh, the New World vultures were um, considered to be um, uh, closely related to storks for some time, or at least it was debated whether they were close to storks or not for a long time, increasingly, um, uh, like the major kind of taxonomic organizations who uh, classify, you know, the major groups of living birds. Um, tend to put the um, the New World vultures um, as a, as members of a different group, or they label it as a different group called Cathardiformes, um, and reserve Accipitriformes for only the um, the kind of hawk and eagle group. So um, that's currently what we're going with. Um, but I, I do think it would be perfectly justifiable to consider all of them to be Accipitriformes. But oh well, I, I think I think it's kind of pointless to kind of split the New World vultures out. But okay whatever everybody else is doing it now so uh, we're, we're going to go with um accipitra forms in, in the narrow sense only including um the hawks and eagles and such 
So uh, they are currently considered to be the um, living sister group to the um, the New World vultures, and uh, that is uh, pretty consistent across like all recent genetic studies. So yeah, no no storks around here. Except <laughs> um, um, forms. Uh, include over 200 living species, so uh, yeah, they are quite a diverse group, um, and there are remains known from the Eocene onwards. So there are a few uh, features um, that they that they share with each other that other birds don't, but it, it's actually been kind of hard to find uh, these uh, shared anatomical features uh, for this group, uh, because traditionally the falcons were thought to be closely related to accipitriforms, and in fact all of them together were considered falconiform birds uh, in traditional literature. So if you mm -hmm. if you look like even in like fairly recent uh, articles on birds of prey, you might see the term falconiform used for all like these diurnal birds of prey. Nowadays, it's only used for falcons because it turns out the falcons are not closely related to the other guys. But yeah, um, in terms of uh, what the accipitriforms and the narrow sins actually share, uh, there, it's actually been very, quite difficult to find features. I, I think in part that's because no one runs phylogenetic analyses on them, so there's that problem again, or not a morphological, <laughs> not morphological analyses at least. But um, yeah, so someone, so someone get on it. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they do have some curious uh, features that set them apart from the New World vultures. So one of these features is that the females tend to be larger than the males, and in some cases much larger. Um, and it is strongly debated, like, why this is the case. Um, so they're not the only birds of prey to do this. In fact, the, um, the most of the owls and also the falcons also tend to have uh, females that are larger than the males. Um, and many explanations have been proposed, like some people suggest, oh, maybe uh, this is to avoid competition between the sexes, so uh, the males can go after smaller prey and the females can hunt larger prey and all that. And But people are then, then like, okay, but why is the female always larger in that case? Like, you know, it could work equally well the other way around. Um, uh, there was a pretty recent paper that uh, reviewed these hypotheses, and they suggested um, that the hypothesis with the strongest support is the idea that it's because the females are the primary defenders of the nests um, in these birds. So both parents, uh, a mated pair, uh, both parents will take care of the young, but it is usually the female that spends most of the time like actually sitting on the eggs and is staying at the nest and, you know, keeping the predators away and all that. Um, now, if the male sees a predator near the nest uh, when he's around, of course, he'll, he'll, he'll join in and help drive off the predator. But by and large, uh, it's mostly the female's job to do that. And so this paper um, argued that uh, this is the hypothesis that best explains why the female um, um, diurnal raptors tend to be larger than, than the males. Uh, it's because they are responsible for nest defense primarily, and so uh, they are selected to be bigger and bigger so they can more effectively drive off predators. And of course, some people say, well, but a lot of birds will defend their nests against predators, right? And they, they don't necessarily show this this kind of um, sexual size dimorphism. Um, but uh, the authors um, argue that, well, in raptors specifically, uh, raptors already have kind of the weaponry to make their attacks on intruders very effective. They already have these sharp claws and beaks. So um, because they, they already have the tools to kind of uh, do this, um, it may be that they can be more easily selected for in this direction where they get selected for uh, more and more effective um, traits that help them defend their nests. And in, in addition, um, it turns out that in, in raptors that um, uh, have very little size uh, difference between the sexes, or in cases where the males are larger, um, it turns out that the females do not um, perform most of the nest defense, um, and usually it, it is shared more equally between the sexes. So um, in those few exceptions seem to, uh, you know, actually uh, prove the rule in, in that sense, um, that it seems to be nest defense that is the most important factor in determining uh, why female um, raptors tend to be larger. Um, Accipitriforms also tend to build like these huge nests out of sticks. Um, yeah, like uh, if, if you travel through you know places where bald eagles or ospreys build their nests, you can 
easily see like these huge stick nests in trees and oftentimes they'll come back to the same nest year after year and keep adding more and more sticks to it until like, <laughs> these nests are just absolutely massive um yeah it, it's really really wild I, I think in fact the largest bird nest on record is a is the nest of a bald eagle so yeah they can make absolutely humongous nests um, and this is quite in contrast to the New World vultures, which a lot of the times don't even build nests at all. They just plop down on a on a patch of ground or uh, find a ledge on a high cliff or something and just just lay their eggs right right on the right on the ground there. So yeah, they the New World vultures don't really build nests, but accipitriforms build gigantic nests. Um, yeah, so accipitriforms can be split into a few major groups. Um, but before we go into them, do you have anything to add about these topics? <laughs> well, I, I'm definitely familiar with osprey nests. <laughs> Most of the time, when I go, when we drive near the coast, uh, I can see one, and I usually the birds not. The, most of the time, the birds aren't actually on the nest, mm. um, but like they, they've built like, well, I, oh, not they, like the local people have like built like special like osprey platforms uh -huh. for them to go and like make their nests. So that's kind of like a neat way to encourage the ospreys to hang around yeah that's really cool <laughs> that's definitely a species that's quite common around here and mm. i've seen more than once easily that's awesome yeah <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll talk about ospreys in a very shortly um but uh first let's talk about a, a different group um the uh, secretary birds which are only known from one living species so it's the secretary bird um <laughs> But uh, it does have a, um, uh, stem members, uh, stem group members that are known from the Oligocene onwards. Um, and oddly enough, those um, fossil secretary birds uh, have been found in Europe. So um, the modern secretary bird is only found in sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it seems that they once had a wider distribution. And I'll, I'll show a picture of, of one in a moment. But um, the secretary bird is such a distinctive species. I, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's definitely one of my favorite um, raptors because, yeah, you, you can't mistake it for anything else uh, with a, not only the color, the coloration, but also the very long legs. Um, and they spend most of their time on foot. Um, they are able to fly and they can soar high up into the air like uh, most of the other raptors can. Uh, but the vast majority of their time is spent on foot. And so they walk around on the ground looking for prey and they'll, they'll hunt, you know, all kinds of small vertebrates. They'll hunt small mammals, small birds. Um, uh, various kinds of uh, reptiles, um, and they are especially famous for killing uh, snakes. Um, and they have a very odd way of dispatching their prey. So what they'll do is they'll, they have these uh, kind of short, stumpy toes, and so they'll use their feet to kick and stomp on top of their prey, just stamp all over them, and then they, they kill them that way, uh, which is a very odd way of killing something, but it works. Um, in fact, people have measured like how much, um, you know, how strongly they can stomp and um it turns out that secretary birds can stomp on the ground uh with uh, the force of five times their own body weight so yeah <laughs> not good news if you're a snake um yeah uh quite an interesting bird um i've seen them in captivity like a couple times but not super often um they they can get to be fairly tall like 1.3 meters or so or like four feet i think so yeah they're definitely very striking birds um do you have anything else to, to say about them uh, i don't think i've had the fortune to see one in mm -hmm. captivity actually um none of the zoos i've gone to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seem to have had them or if they had i just haven't been able to see them by chance um i will say two things one i, I think like in terms of like bird names this is probably one of my favorite instances <laughs> of that it's so context dependent right, right. If I remember correctly, like the secretary bird is called that because, as you can see in the photo, it has like these black feathers right. sticking out of their head. And it kind of looks like, you know, back in older times when you have like a desk secretary, they put like their quill pen on their ear or something right. to just kind of hold it. And so it kind of looks like that. Right. Um, I just always laugh because, you know, for such a, you know, a powerful and formidable hunter mm -hmm. as this, you know, killing prey by just kicking it on the ground. Right. Um, you know, you, I, I'll never forget that there was, there was a, a Disney film from the 70s oh, yeah. called Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, right. which is a very quirky movie. Um, uh, the plot is just all over the place, but it's fun. <laughs> I, I got to watch it again recently and I mm. forgot how much I liked it. Um, but there's a character in there. So like the, it's one of those like live action hybrid things like Mary Poppins. Uh -huh. There's a scene that they go 
into a book to get a medallion or something. Hmm. And it's it's like a Robin Hood kind of thing. And these animals that wear clothes and they uh. walk around and they have a big soccer match. And so there's the, the king lion and his secretary bird. <laughs> and I always laugh because the secretary bird is like the goofiest. Like it's all sophisticated, but then it's just, it's goofy. It's non, he's non-threatening. <laughs> um, he's often like a coward at times. Right. And so it's like the complete opposite <laughs> of what like a secretary bird is usually like right so I, I always love that like that sub subversion oh that's interesting yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah I, I guess hmm yeah that that's one of the very few um popular kind of depictions of secretary birds i, I can think of and uh, yeah like they, they don't even feature that much in like nature documentaries or anything which i think is a shame um I've been told once um, that apparently they're they're quite hard to film in their natural habitat. Like they, they tend to live in areas where the grass is really tall and you can't see anything. Um, so um, yeah, I, I guess that's probably probably one of the reasons why. But definitely, I, they 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 deserve more attention because yeah, they are they are such a distinctive looking bird and you know so cool in many ways. So uh, yeah, they definitely would love to see them feature more. Um, Basically, uh, this uh, kind of long-legged uh, crane eagle that kills prey by stomping. Like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the heck? I'm almost kind of surprised that yeah. it's not featured more. I mean, it's such a it's a staple of like the African savanna. And right. So many you know popular depictions of like the African savanna, all these iconic animals, and there's like no secretary bird. Right. Um, you know, no bustards for that. For that. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Mention that either. There's a, <laughs> I don't know. There's something going on with 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 savanna birds that yeah you get get on it, people. Yeah, right, right. Or ground hornbills, like yeah, yeah. yeah or, or or guinea fowl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like why why are you sleeping on all, all these you know very distinctive looking, uh, very prominent birds in this in this ecosystem? <laughs> yeah, that is curious. That is curious. Uh, I, I guess the mammals steal the show all the time, but yeah, like even mm. so. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I guess ostrich is the only one that gets that much um, airtime. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's big enough, I guess. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, honorary mammal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, <laughs> hopefully with this show we can do our, our part in promoting <laughs> the secretary bird. Um, on the next slide, I show some bones from one of those uh, fossil secretary birds, or stem secretary birds from Europe. So this is a Pelargo papus from uh, France, um, and so on the um, the leftmost uh, side of the image, you can see kind of the, the tarsum metatarsus, so that's the, um, the long foot bones, um, and you can see how long and slender they are um, in this uh, in this species as well. So probably it lived pretty similarly to the modern secretary bird. It, it was a little bit smaller than the modern secretary bird, but overall it probably uh, behaved in a similar manner, I would expect. Um, and yeah, this seems to show that um, in the Oligocene to Miocene of France, there were probably these open habitats for these secretary birds to live in uh, and, and hunt in, probably. So uh, we don't have too much in the way of a fossil record for this group, but we do have this, and uh, that is a uh, it does tell us uh, some things about the former distribution of secretary birds, which is pretty neat. Um, do you have anything else to to add to this? Uh, no. All right. Well, let's go to the next uh, major group of accipitriforms, forms, and these are the ospreys. Um, now, depending on who you ask, there are either one or two living species of ospreys. Um, so usually usually it's one. If you ask most people, it's one. But I think um, the International Ornithological Congress uh, currently classifies them as two separate species. So they split off the um, Australasian population as its own species. So they have the Western osprey in most parts of the world and the Eastern osprey in Australasia. Um, incidentally, uh, I've seen both of them, <laughs> so that's kind of oh. neat. <laughs> um, but but in any case, um, you know when when it's considered a um, a single species, um, the osprey is. Um, is often cited as like one of the most wide, widely distributed bird species on earth um, and that's because like this you know if it's one species it can be found on every continent except for antarctica and even if it's two species like the western osprey is found everywhere except australia and antarctica so yeah super wide distribution for a single species to have um you know interesting enough most of the candidates for this kind of super wide cosm cosmopolitan distribution in birds, in bird species, um, is found in raptors. Um, I'll I'll try to remember to mention another example later. But yeah, the osprey is definitely one of the candidates that is up there, one of the widest distributions. Um, the osprey fossil record is not that great, 
But uh, we do know that they were around from the Eocene onwards, and that's because the talons of ospreys have a very distinctive shape that is very different from that of other raptor species. So even if you find only the claws, um, fossils of the claws, um, you, you can um, uh, identify them as osprey fossils. And so osprey claws are known from like the Eocene onwards and some from the Oligocene and Miocene as well. Uh, and the reason they have these specialized claws is they hunt in a way that is very distinctive and, uh, yeah, unique among, among raptors. So they are specialized fish hunters. Um, in fact, uh, they pretty much eat entirely fish. Like, you know, looking at them, you'd see that they have these hooked talons and beaks like, like most of the other raptors do. You'd think they'd be perfectly good at hunting other types of animals as well, but they almost never do. Like, like over 95% of their diet is fish. Um, and like, even in when they hunt other things, like it's mostly things that happen to be swimming in the water. Like, <laughs> like, oh, a snake is swimming in the water. So I'll just grab that, like things like that. Like, yeah, like they are super specialized for eating fish. And even though there are other um, fish hunting raptors, um, the way that ospreys catch fish is not done by any of the other, um, any of those species. Um, what they do is they will, plunge down high from the sky, kind of folding their wings behind them and stretching their feet out in front of them, and then kind of submerge deep into the water as they as they dive, as they plunge dive into the water. So yeah, in a way it's kind of similar to the plunge diving behavior we see in some of the um the core water birds, like the um the boobies and some of the pelicans, for example, where you fly to a great height and then just dive deep down into the water from the sky. <laughs> Um, yeah, whereas most other uh, raptor species tend to just grab prey from the surface of the water, so they'll swoop low over the surface and, like, snatch a fish from the near close to the surface of the water, but they don't submerge most of their body down down in there. Um, whereas ospreys do. Ospreys, if you um, have seen, like, slow motion footage of them in wildlife documentaries, I've certainly seen this a few times, uh, you can you can see this very clearly when they dive down to the sky, they kind of plunge their entire body down in there, so they're able to catch fish, like, even swimming at, you know, a uh, fair depth, and then uh, latch onto the fish with their talons and then uh, kind of make their way back to the surface and then take off. Um, they also have a very distinctive behavior once they've caught the fish is that they will actually turn the fish around in their in their feet uh, while they're holding it, right? And so they'll align the fish's body, the main axis of the fish's body with their own, so parallel to their own body. Um, and so you often see uh, pictures of ospreys flying with the with the fish uh, with the fish's head kind of pointed in the same direction as the as the as itself. Um, and I've seen people like caption this as memes and things like "I will show you the world" and things like that. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> I love the photo of the um with the osprey going to work. Like, uh -huh. It has a hammerhead shark in it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you can see them like catching some pretty wild types of fish like yeah yeah of course the hammerhead shark is one of the like, one of the most uh, surprising ones but yeah the you know there are also um pictures of them uh, catching like a uh, fish called a needle fish which are these like long um slender predatory fish like very long and narrow um snouts and sharp teeth um yeah they, they catch all kinds of weird weird things uh, even though they even though it's mostly fish um and um and yeah i guess um the behavior of the kind of turning their um the prey around to align with their own bodies is a way to reduce some um, um, drag while they're flying through the air. So that's, uh, that's pretty neat. Um, I have actually seen an osprey catch a fish before, like in, in person, uh, which was, yeah, which was really cool. Um, so there used to be, um, well, yeah, I imagine still there, but um, when I lived in uh, Maryland um, near the university, there was this huge lake where, where I would often visit and go birding at. Um, so there would be a lot of water birds that would gather there at certain times of the year. And, um, during um you know spring and summertime uh there would be ospreys um you're probably passing through on their migration and yeah once when i was there i saw i saw an osprey flying around and uh i did indeed get to see it kind of fold up its wings and go into that dive and plunge into the water so it, it was some distance off but watching it through the by my binoculars it was pretty clear um and i watched i watched it take off and you know do the whole turning the fish around thing and, and take and fly off into the distance um so yeah that, that was that was definitely really cool I, um, yeah it was a behavior that i'd only previously seen in wildlife documentaries so yeah um 
and um, kind of uh, as a further adaptation to help them in this behavior is that they're one of the few um, diurnal raptors with what we call semi-zygodactyl feet. Now we talk about uh, like, uh, the arrangement of bird feet a lot um, on the show, but basically the, the default, the ancestral condition in modern birds is that the innermost toe, or hallux, uh, equivalent to our big toe, is pointed backwards, so that allows the bird to grasp onto things with its feet. And um, in birds that have zygodactyl feet, the outermost toe is also pointed backwards, so they have two toes in front and two toes in the back. Um, and in semi-zygodactyl feet, the outermost toe is usually kind of spread out to the side, but um, when the bird wants to, it can rotate it backwards so that it points completely backwards, and uh, that allows it to, you know, possibly help it get a better grip on certain things, like slippery fish, for example. And so in the osprey, they have this reversible outer toe that can help them catch their prey. And this is pretty rare in, in diurnal raptors. Um, you know, some sources will even say uh, things like the osprey is the only one. That, that's not actually true, in, uh, especially in recent times people have started to find like some of the fish eagles also have this ability, which makes sense because they also eat fish. Um, and it turns out um, some of the um, Iranian kites also have um, this ability now. If you're not familiar with the um, Iranian kites, that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get to them soon. But uh, uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're a group of uh, very... Um, very beautiful uh, raptors. I, I like them a lot. But uh, anyways, um, so yeah, ospreys are one of the few diurnal raptors with this kind of reversible outer toe. And these are all features that help them catch your fishy prey. Um, do you have anything to add about uh, ospreys? I know you see them quite a bit. Yeah, um, I will say lucky you. <laughs> I, I, I have seen an osprey dive into the water, mm. but not catch anything. Mm. Like it, it missed its chance and it flew off. Yeah, but I have seen them after the fact. Like they'll be flying, like from a tree line with a nearby lake, right. and they'll have a like, fish in their feet. And I'm like, oh, that would have been cool to see them catch it. Right, so, right. <laughs> yeah, in the aftermath, right. Like, never an actual like successful hunt. Mm, mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, that's how it is for predators. Uh, you fail quite a bit uh, before you get something, but um. But yeah, I well, hopefully you get to see it too someday. Uh, I imagine uh, you'll get uh, plenty of opportunities to do so. Um, yeah, uh, it's something, um, an interesting behavior that people have seen ospreys do is while they're migrating, they often like carry a fish with them in flight. And so um, I, I think uh, I think people um, or these birders often call this a packing a lunch because uh, I, I guess that's kind of the significance of that is, um, is what, it's, what it's doing. And, and um, on the subject of unusual things ospreys have caught, there is like one record, I think, of an osprey that supposedly caught an orange in its talons and was seen with it in flight. Um, oh. <laughs> and uh, and I think uh, on reflection, people suggested that maybe, you know, it caught someone's ornamental goldfish from a pond or something. But... Uh, but it was reported as an orange, so that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I mean, I guess it'd be a step up from seagull with french fries. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> orange. <laughs> that vitamin C. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, uh, let's move on to the next group then. Uh, so the Accipitrids, and this is the biggest group within the Accipitriforms, or at least out of the three groups that we're looking at. Um, <laughs> so whereas, uh, you know, Ospreys and uh, secretary birds are only known from like one living representative, maybe two. Uh, there are over um, 200 living species of accipitrids, and these include like all the hawks and eagles and uh, the old world vultures and various other diurnal birds of prey. Um, they are known from the Eocene onwards, although their early fossil record especially is quite sparse, so we don't know too much about the early evolution of this group. Um, and today they can be found worldwide, except Antarctica. like truly worldwide um like well, when i say worldwide in the series i usually mean like they're found on at least every continent at least part of every continent but um accipitrids like they can be found in pretty much every terrestrial ecosystem there is um other than antarctica um yeah like pretty much in every land ecosystem there there is some kind of accipitrid like, they're doing its thing um they are extremely varied in their size and prey choice um yeah like you have the huge uh, sea eagles which are you know big like a bald eagle is a kind of sea eagle um for example um 
but um you also have like little little tiny uh, hawks like uh, there, there's one species that's aptly called the tiny hawk which is you know about the size <laughs> of a thrush so think think the size of an american robin or a european blackbird um and uh, that, that's a that's a species that specializes in hunting uh, hummingbirds so yeah they they span a huge spectrum of different uh, specializations um, a notable feature of the accipitrids is that their two innermost toes so the hallux and also the second toe um are enlarged compared to the other uh, talons on the feet and what this is useful for is they use a special kind of way to kill their prey called raptor prey restraint now this is pretty interesting so um in pretty much all well most uh, in pretty much most raptors um when they are hunting uh, small prey so when we say in, in this context small prey means prey that's small enough for them to grab with like just one foot uh, and that, that of course varies depending on how big the raptor is so a small prey to one raptor might might be a large prey to another um, but in any case um, when most raptors catch prey uh, that is small enough to be encircled with one foot and no matter if they're an accipitrid or or an owl um, what they'll often do is they'll just squeeze the foot uh, shut you know, tightly tightly on the on the prey item and then that constricts the prey and the prey suffocates to death because of that and what's notable about this killing strategy is that the the talons themselves don't really like injure the prey much like you think like with those very sharp talons they would be the primary kind of killing uh, agent uh, when raptors hunt their prey but instead it's like you know the suffocation that kills these small prey items mm. um however um when they're hunting larger prey that is too big to be killed by uh, the simple suffocation method, uh, accipitrids use a different method that is, has been named raptor prey restraint or RPR, which is meant to look like a ripper because that's kind of what happens. Um, <laughs> yeah, so what they'll do is they'll latch onto the prey item uh, with their uh, talons and especially with the big uh, innermost talons on their feet. Um, and then they will try to like hold the prey to the ground with their body weight. So what they'll often do is they'll, they'll flap their wings vigorously to stay balanced on top of the prey item um, while clinging to the prey item with their feet. And as the prey item struggles, uh, you know, as they try to get away, because the talons are sunk into them, the prey item kind of tears open its own wounds um, as, it, as it struggles. Um, and over time, if the uh, accipitrid is successful in subduing the prey for long enough, um, the prey item, you know, eventually gets too injured and tired to struggle any longer, and then the hawk or eagle or whatever can start to feed. Now, the nasty thing about this is that it's a very drawn out process, um, and uh, oftentimes the prey is actually not dead when the when the raptor starts feeding. So, oh. uh, yeah, it's <laughs> not a pretty sight, but uh, it is effective. Um, and uh, quite interestingly, this method has also been suggested um, to have been used by the extinct dromaeosaurid raptor dinosaurs. Uh, so the Mesozoic yeah. dinosaurs that are called raptors. Yeah. Um, and because they, they share with accipitrids like large claws on the innermost toes, especially the famous kind of killing claw you see often um, uh, shown retracted in popular depictions, which we, we do know they actually did hold it retracted from the anatomy as well as trackways. Um, and uh, and also they are also able to um to clench the foot in a sort of fist like structure like uh, similar to what uh, you know modern birds can do especially accipitrids and so it is thought that um, when uh, these dromaeosaurids hunted like relatively large prey they might have also used a similar method where they latched onto their prey item with the claws on their feet and meanwhile because um dromaeosaurids had um these big feathered wings even the ones that couldn't fly uh, very similar to modern birds uh, they had these big feathered wings so they could flap and stay stable on top of their prey items and uh, eventually um, kill it through this kind of blood loss and shock um, so uh, it does seem quite plausible that this was the case so uh, again another uh, parallel between these mesozoic raptors and the living groups called raptors <laughs> yeah uh, do you have anything else to add about uh, these guys in general because we'll we'll go through them uh, in more detail in the next few slides sure um, I will say like the raptor pay restraint mm -hmm. like that just reminds me of one of my favorite xkcd comic oh yeah right that, that, I, that came out like a decade ago mm. i have it cut out on my bulletin board right here actually <laughs> where it's a little girl reading about dinosaurs and the mom or the sister or whatever is like you know you, oh, you're reading about dinosaurs i remember when well, they were like when i was a kid and they've gotten all weird now like right had, you know 
feathers and stuff, and it's all dorky. And the girl's like, yeah. And then she talks about raptor prey restraint, right. the dromaeosaurs. And then, like the 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 other person is just so entranced that they decide to sit down and read about these dinosaurs too. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of my favorites too. Right? That's that's really cool. Because <laughs> I remember that paper. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, growing up and reading about dromaeosaurs, I guess the idea was like the the, the large sickle claw right. was like a knife. Right. These things would just hop up on animals and just like rip, 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 like, <laughs> right. like, cutting into a steak, and it was like this horrible thing. <laughs> right. But like. Yeah, I guess like when you actually look at the structure, like there's nothing that really says right like knife. Right. It looks like the claw of a of a hawk. You know? Yeah. It, I guess with the biomechanical studies and whatnot, I mean it was used in almost the same way, really. Right, right. Yeah. I yep, yeah, I agree. <laughs> it uh it is a very um very plausible model. I think it's a it's a really good paper too. Um and um it's one of those papers that I, I think it's very readable, like even if you're not an expert on the subject, uh, like even if you're just like really interested in the subject, but not, not like you know, someone who actually studies it, um, it is written in a very kind of clear way that uh, it makes it you know, very easy to read and uh, very informative in that respect. Um, so that was, a, that was a paper by uh, Denver Fowler and colleagues who has, he has done all kinds of things like related to dinosaurs, but he, he, did, um, he did do a couple of those papers on like the Mesozoic raptors and also the raptors of today. He had an earlier paper, um, he had an earlier paper where he basically examined like all the different groups of modern raptors and uh, essentially did a review of how they kill things and, and how that relates to the different types of claw shapes and sizes that they have. Um, and so that, that was sort of the prequel paper to his Dromaeosaurid paper because he was first trying to figure out, okay, so how do modern birds of prey use their claws exactly? And then he wrote that paper, which is also a very good paper. I recommend reading it. Uh, and I, I have it cited in the, um, the reference list of this episode. Um, and then and then later he did, um, he applied basically what he found out from the uh, modern birds to Dromaeosaurids and found, oh, okay, so it seems that uh, it's likely that they also use this raptor prey restraint behavior, which is really, really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. We, 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 should, we might as well just link that in the description. So <laughs> yeah, we probably should. Y'all want, want to check it out? I, I, I think it's open access. Yeah, it is. It is. It's in uh, PLOS One, which is an open access journal. Both, both of those papers are, in fact. So, yeah. All oh, right. <laughs> so, um, on the next slide, I show a general uh, phylogeny of a, uh, the accipitrids. Now, this is a simplified phylogeny because there are a ton of species in this group. And so, there, there are some, like, you know, like, offshoots and individual species that are, are don't technically fall into uh, the groups I've listed here, but for simplification's sake, I, I put in all the major groups, and this is the current consensus on their phylogeny based on the recent uh, molecular studies. And so, yeah, there's quite a diversity here of different types of raptors. So let's start from the um, left here. So first off is the Elanine kites. Um, now, I, I think one of the things you'll notice here is that a lot of the common names we use for raptors don't correspond to clades at all mm -hmm. like uh, there are different uh, groups within accipitrids that have been called eagles and different groups have been called hawks and different groups that have been called kites and different groups that have been called vultures even so um pretty much all the major kind of general common names we have for accipitrids don't correspond to like um you know, groups that are actually closely related to each other, but more likely to some eco ecological or morphological kind of features that they have. Mm. Um, so usually the term kite is used for uh, various species that are, well, they kind of fly like kites. They are very buoyant in flight and they can kind of kind of hang still in the air and while, while not beating their wings very much. Um, so they are very, very graceful. Um, so the Elanine kites are one of these groups and um, they can be found on pretty much every continent, I think. Um, and uh, they do indeed kind of, you know, just float in the air like kites. Um, I have seen uh, one species, the um, black-winged kite um, in Taiwan, where my family lives. Um, and um, it's pretty cool, um, the story of um, that species on Taiwan, because uh, it is a relatively recent arrival to the island. Um, like. In the field guide that my parents used, like before I was born, uh, the bird, the field guide to birds of Taiwan, uh, you couldn't find black-winged kite in there. 
But um, in the early 2000s, they apparently made their way to the island like on their own and then just became established and started breeding there. So now now they are you know, reasonably common. Uh, and so I, on some occasions when I've gone back to visit my family, I, I have been able to see um, these guys. And um, they, they are quite incredible flyers, super graceful. Um, they, they just kind of float in the air. And uh, yeah, it's one of, one of those things where this is an animal that lives in the air like there there is no doubt this is a flying animal um they mostly kind of um float and hover over um areas where they're likely to find fine prey so it's oftentimes open fields things like that they're also very good at catching like flying insects in the air so they're, they'll catch a lot of dragonflies um and uh, they also include one of the few um, nocturnal types of exhibitrids and that is the uh, letter winged kite of australia um and uh, yeah, most exhibitors, of course, are diurnal raptors, but we have this one weirdo. Um, and um, like I mentioned when I mentioned the uh, osprey, uh, they're also one of the few uh, diurnal raptors with, with semi-zygodactyl feet with the outermost toe that can reverse. Um, they don't hunt fish much, though, so I, I'm not sure what the significance of that is necessarily, but it's an odd thing that they have. Um, there is one species of um, Ulaning kite in North America, and that is the um, white-tailed kite. But um, I think that species usually lives further west than than you live. Um, yeah, I don't rec I don't recognize seeing right wild kites. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I and further west than where I lived, for that matter. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't seen uh, a white-tailed kite either. Um, now there are a couple of species um, that it's often discussed in that are often discussed in conjunction with the white-tailed kite um, because they are also called kites and they even look very similar with a similar kind of black and white kind of coloring. Uh, all the Ulanian kites have basically have this general black and white coloration. Um, and there are two other species in North America with similar coloration. Uh, one of these is the um, swallow-tailed kite, which is an absolutely unmistakable form. It, it, it's in the name. It has this swallow-like forked tail um, and it it is supposedly super spectacular to see, and I'd love to see one uh, in the wild at some point, but I haven't. Um, and uh, the other species is the um, Mississippi kite. Um, and uh, it also looks quite similar to an Elanian kite. But the funny thing is, neither of those are members of the Elanian kites. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in fact, they're not even closely related to each other either. Like the, um, the, um, uh, the swallow-tailed kite is actually more closely related to the honey buzzards a few lineages down and the mississippi kite is closely related to the bootio hawks which are over on the right on here so yeah so several times in the raptors there they have evolved this kind of very similar lifestyle and coloration um and yeah this seems to be a thing that exhibitors do is like convergence 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 it's, it's it gets confusing and i wish someone would do more morphological phylogenetic studies on them now um let's keep going um now, we'll see here, I, I kept saying, you know, the old world vultures and new world vultures are not closely related to each other. They don't, they don't form an exclusive clade. But, uh, um, well, here's the thing. It turns out that not all old world vultures form an exclusive clade with each other either. <laughs> so really, the vulture lifestyle has evolved at least three times independently among the living raptorial clades. So that's pretty incredible. So first up here, I have a group that I decided to call the African vultures, even though they're not the only vultures in Africa and are not only found in Africa. But OK, the, the center of their diversity is in Africa because the uh, most of the yeah pr pretty much actually all the living species can be found in Africa, even though um, some of them range outside of it. And so this is a group that has some very weird feeding strategies. So the species pictured here um, is called the um, Lammergeier or bearded vulture. Um, mm. I know Lammergeier was the name that I first knew it as when I was you know little and reading books and watching wildlife documentaries. But um, in recent times, uh, I know the uh, Vulture Conservation Foundation, for example, has discouraged the use of the name Lammergeier because the name Lammergeier means a uh, lamb vulture and has led to the belief that the species preys on lambs. Oh. Um, and so people kill them because of that. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, there aren't really any records of them actually uh, preying on like domestic lambs. So, uh, mm. it, you know, like most vultures, they're primarily scavengers. 
Now, very occasionally there are reports of them hunting wild goats. They spook the goats or sheep off of cliffs and then let them fall to their deaths, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, that's obviously not really an option in most uh, contexts when it comes to domestic sheep. So, you know, d domestic sheep and goats are probably safe from this kind of uh, behavior. There are definitely, you know, much more pressing concerns when it comes to uh, potential threats to your sheep and goats. Um, and so the Vulture Conservation Foundation uh, uh, encourages the use of the name bearded vulture for the species instead. And so fair enough. Um, now, what is especially weird about the bearded vulture is that it does not primarily feed on, like, by, by spooking uh, goats and sheep off cliffs. Uh, it primarily eats bones. Yeah, not, not the meat off the bones, the bones themselves. Now, specifically, it's after the bone marrow inside the bones. But to do this, what it does is uh, for smaller bones, it just swallows them whole. And it, is, it has an amazingly acidic stomach that can just dissolve the bone like as soon as it heads in. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, but for larger bones that it can't swallow in one go, what it'll do is it'll carry the bones high into the sky and find a nice big rock to drop it on. And then it'll do this, drop the bones from the sky, and hopefully the bone shatters on impact. If it doesn't work the first time, it'll keep trying again and again until it works. Um, and that's that's a way they splinter up the bone, and then they'll swallow the individual bone splinters, which is pretty metal. <laughs> um, and sometimes, um, in addition to the sheep and goats, the other type of uh, live prey that they will hunt is uh, tortoises, and they will break open tortoises in much the same way they break open uh, bones. So yeah, a uh, pretty unusual way of feeding a uh, vulture that specializes in feeding on the bones, which of course it's not in much competition for that. Not, not many things like to eat bones. <laughs> um, there are some other members of this group. Uh, so one of them is the um, Egyptian vulture. Um, and the Egyptian vulture uh, is a more of a generalist um, kind of vulture. It'll, it'll pretty much eat anything you can find. Um, but uh, it does have a pretty interesting behavior that it uses to break open eggs, especially ostrich eggs. So ostrich eggs are incredibly tough, right? Uh, like a person can stand on an ostrich egg and not break it. Um, but if you can break it, there's a lot of goodies inside, <laughs> right? Just imagine like how many omelets you can make for, for, from an ostrich egg. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, so Egyptian vultures, um, of course, uh, uh, can't really break through the ostrich egg directly, but what they can do uh, is that they will actually pick up stones and then throw it at the eggs. And then, you know, after they've done this enough times, hopefully the egg breaks open and they are able to feed on the contents inside. So uh, they are, uh, you know, one of the examples of tool using birds, which is pretty neat. And a third vulture species in this group is the palm nut vulture, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, like you said, the palm nut vulture is kind of the panda bear of uh, raptors because it mostly eats fruit, which is super odd. Now, it does hunt prey occasionally, uh, and it also does scavenge occasionally. So, oddly enough, uh, the prey that it likes to eat are uh, mostly aquatic prey. So, it will often stalk around, like, edges of ponds to hunt crabs and things. It also catch a fish from the surface of the water. And, like, like what does that? Like, what eats both fruit and fish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the weirdest surf and turf I've ever heard. Right, right, right. And specializes in eating those things. Like, what? Why? Oh, God, I, I'd love to know more about the palm nut vulture. Like, it, it seems like it's a really interesting case study in like in evolving a weird ecology and things. Um, now, there is at least one more member of the, this group, but it's not called a vulture. Um, it is called the African Harrier Hawk, and it also has a weird way of getting its food. Um, so the African Harrier Hawk has a double jointed uh, ankle joint. So remember, uh, the main joint you see usually on a bird's uh, leg is not the knee, it is the ankle, the, the backwards pointing joint that you see in most birds. Um, that is the ankle, and usually the knee is much further higher up on the body um, and covered in feathers, so you can't really see it under most circumstances. So, of course, a usual normal ankle uh, bends you know, backwards in the manner that you expect. But the African Harrier Hawk is able to bend its ankle the other way around too, which is pretty freaky. Um, and it uses this ability to be able to reach into crevices and feel around for prey uh, so it can grab like little animals hiding inside tiny crevices uh, by, you know, putting its leg in there and like, 
bending it around in different directions um, especially um, uh, uh, the babies of other birds if they're like inside a tree hole or inside a, a deep nest that the you know the hawk itself can't fit in there but it can stick its leg up in there and feel around inside and grab whatever it wants to eat in there so uh, yeah that's also a pretty wild way of feeding <laughs> It's just a, an incredible collection of birds. It's right. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the, group call is like the, the inventive vultures or something. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty good name. Yeah, the inventive vultures. Yeah, we, we, should, we should promote that. The inventive vultures or the Japatines. Uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, they are closely related to a group called the, um, the Pernines, which include um, several groups called honey buzzards. Actually, you know, this group is a weird group, too, in terms of feeding ecology, because the, the raptors that are called honey buzzards, um, as their name suggests, um, they, they do eat a little bit of honey, but mostly what they're after is uh, bees and wasps and the larvae of those, those insects. So they will, yeah, they will just, like, attack wasp nests and, like, eat the, the insects inside. Like, jeez. <laughs> um, and they do have some adaptations that seem to protect them from stings when they do this. Um, so they're, the feathers on their head are kind of, like, like dense and scale like uh, so to you know help prevent uh, wasp stings and bee stings from penetrating um and it has also been reported that they've seemed to produce a sort of kind of weird substance like kind of powdery filamenty substance on their feathers and people have speculated that maybe the substance is a sort of chemical deterrent to bees and wasps and it keeps them away uh, uh preventing them from counterattacking while they're feeding so really odd um, and pretty much most of their diet consists of you know bees and wasps and their larvae so that's odd um something else interesting about a lot of the honey buzzards is that um you know being being mostly kind of insectivorous they they're not as uh, powerful as some of the other other types of raptors are so uh in terms of the coloration they often mimic like slightly larger species of raptors um and so uh you know it's thought that this is a way so that they you know avoid predation from other types of animals that might want to eat them, it, including other types of raptors, because raptors uh, usually aren't fussy about killing other types of raptors if they want to want something to eat. Um, so uh, yeah, that, so they they they're like um, bee and wasp eating uh, raptors that engage in mimicry of other raptors, which is also pretty odd. Um, Another um, group in the Pernines are a group called the Bazas, which are mostly found in like tropical parts of Asia, I think. And they are, they're not a very well known group. I would be, uh, you know, if you've ever heard of Bazas before, you know, hats off to you, you're a true bird nerd. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they are these usually smallish raptors with these jaunty little crests on their head. Um, and they mostly, you know, they'll, they'll feed on all kinds of um, uh, smaller prey. But interestingly enough, they also feed on fruits as well. So a bit like the palm nut vulture in that regard. So they're kind of omnivorous uh, raptors. It has been found in some species, apparently. Like, they won't breed in captivity unless you provide them with fruit to eat. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, so basically, this this whole lineage, uh, including the um, the Japatines and the Pernines, are a group of like really inventive kind of raptors that do weird things. Um, but uh, let's continue. Um, then we have the more classic kind of old world vultures, and these are the Egyptian vultures. Uh, so these include all the other old world vulture species. Um, and, you know, they, they do a lot of the same things that the new world vultures do. Uh, they're also expert um, scavengers soaring for ages on thermals looking for their food. And there are, you know, different size classes within this group. So like the larger ones will eat different things from the smaller ones um, and have and have a different order of, of feeding when they all gather at the same carcass. You know, usually what happens is like the big, the big species, they are responsible for kind of tearing open the carcass and they'll feed first and um, they'll feed mostly on the hide of the prey. And then the kind of the next bigger species next biggest species will come in and gulp down like the internal organs and the the larger chunks of flesh and then finally you have like the smaller species that kind of stay around at the periphery and pick off the tiny scraps that the others leave behind so it's all a very kind of efficient kind of cleanup crew that they have going on there now um unfortunately the old world vultures a lot of them are under threat and in many cases are critically endangered um and so you know this has been so severe that we have terms like the um, Indian vulture crisis and the African vulture crisis has been, uh, you know, coined to describe these um, mm. these ongoing um, crises. Um, so um, there are several um, reasons for why these vultures are in, in, in decline. Uh, so in India, it was due to the use of a veterinary drug called diclofenac, um, which is 
given to livestock. Um, and now, you know, vultures can stomach a lot, but apparently diclofenac is uh, toxic to them, and so they die from eating it. And so when livestock that have been injected with this drug die and are left out for vultures to eat, uh, you know, or at least where vultures can eat it, they feed on it and they die off in great numbers. Um, and so uh, people have been working to get uh, diclofenac uh, banned from regions where vultures um, live. And uh, so far, I think in, I think in India, it, it already has been. Um, currently, okay. um, people are fighting to get it banned in Europe. Um, so uh, hopefully that sees some results eventually. In, in India, basically the, the vulture decline got so bad that a lot of the um, consequences of not having vultures in the ecosystem are actually you know severely affecting some of the human communities living there because uh, of course without vultures to clean up the carcasses very quickly there are other types of animals that will move in to take advantage of the great abundance of you know food resources the carcasses and in this case uh, it was feral dogs and so you had a huge explosion in the population of feral dogs um, in india in parts of india and uh, of course feral dogs can you know, bring all kinds of troubles with them, like coming into conflict with humans. So not only attacks on humans, but also um, spreading of diseases. So again, vultures have played an incredibly important role in limiting disease spread, uh, not only directly by you know, eating the disease causing pathogens, but also by you know limiting the numbers of other animals that can cause diseases. Um, and whereas in Africa, um, so vultures down there uh, are often hunted and killed um for uh often for reasons related to superstitious beliefs um and so uh, there are definitely people who are working with local cultures there to try and get them to see um, the value of vultures in a different light i guess um and hopefully reduce the the amount of uh, poaching that goes on um so definitely uh fingers crossed that these conservation efforts um, see uh, good results. Uh, definitely, uh, there has been some headway being made in the, the Indian uh, vulture front. So, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, restore these magnificent scavengers to uh, where they should be and where they can, you know, be a great help to not only humans, but also the other um, animals in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, and the old world vultures are closely related to a group called the serpent eagles. And so this is, the, I guess, the first time on this slide where we're encountering the term eagle. So usually the term eagle pretty much is given to all the like, relatively large and robust uh, birds of prey. They just get, all get called eagles. Um, and so as their name suggests, the serpent eagles mostly specialize in preying on snakes. Um, they're mostly found in the old world, I think. I, I don't think there are any new world species that I can remember. Um, and uh, in, um, in Taiwan, one of the most um, commonly seen species is the uh, crested serpent eagle, one of the most commonly seen uh, large raptor species, in fact. So I've seen them a couple times there. Um, there is one particular um, um, serpent eagle species that has become a sort of like general apex predator of its environment, and that is the Philippines eagle, uh, which is also uh, highly endangered, by the way. Um, although there are there are conservation efforts underway to uh, you know, keep it um, away from extinction. Um, so it is a, one of the largest, um, you know, eagles in the world and uh, it is also called the monkey eating eagle and in fact its genus name pithecophaga means like monkey eater basically <laughs> yeah <laughs> and this was due to the belief that it primarily hunted monkeys uh, in its environment um uh, from field studies that have been done it doesn't seem that this is strictly true so it, it certainly is capable of hunting monkeys but uh it, it doesn't seem to be specialized for hunting them but even so uh the fact that it goes after you know things like monkeys and other medium-sized mammals kind of tells us that it's a pretty formidable predator. Um, let's see. Uh, do you have any any comments on the groups that we talked about so far? Um, well, there's certainly a couple favorites of mine here sure. as well. I mean, uh, bearded vultures are mm. just beautiful. Like they they are iconic and striking. And yep. When I first saw them when I was younger, I, I never forgot them. Um, incidentally, like in terms of the, the old world vultures. Um, Again, kind of going back to like my, my general thoughts about vultures yeah. and, and how great they are and how everybody should love them. Part of the reason of this is when I was growing up and I used to watch like the Jungle Book. Oh, yeah. And, and, and related films. Um, like one of my favorite animal characters that yeah. Disney has done, and there's a couple of them, are that the, those four vultures that they have in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> that, um, 
for some reason, I just I think the whole idea is funny. Again, the subversion of of um of stereotypes, I guess, mm-hmm. if you will, in pop culture, where you're talking about like you know vultures are usually seen as like you know these bringers of death and and they're they're kind of harsh and that kind of thing. Right. Whereas in reality, like they're they're chill birds that are just doing their thing and helping out. They kind of went with that, right? In that movie, like th- th- they hang out and they're kind of like you know oh we we, we love having friends because you know nobody wants to hang around with us you know <laughs> they end up being like heroes in the end with, right. with and the main characters and I've never forgotten them uh, and that's kind of helped with my love of vultures mm, um, yeah. <laughs> That that instance itself is really funny because uh, a, a little bit of a tangent. Um, I, when I was younger, and then growing up, like we used to, we used to always think like, oh, these these vultures they're they're British and they, they kind of have like the moppy hair. You know, right. They, they kind of remind us of the Beatles, <laughs> right? You know, like they do like a barbershop quartet. Um, I guess it turns out like when during the film's production, they wanted to get the Beatles to come and voice these characters. That's right. Um, <laughs> And like they made arrangements to do so, but in the end, you know, Lennon came out and you know, hey, we're we're way past our our boy band phase. You know, we're, we're trying to make art here. You know, <laughs> we don't want to associate ourselves with this you know kitty nonsense. <laughs> and so like he eventually like cut the ties and, and dropped that whole thing. Right. So uh, they kept they kept the designs and just changed it to a, a barber shop um, <laughs> as well as to, like to make, to make it a little bit more timeless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess you know barbershop quartet. You, know, you you they're not. You don't really hear a lot of them, all that much. Right. But like they, they they've kind of had like, you know, their role in, in in human pop culture. Like they're they're always around somewhere. So it's like, yeah, totally. <laughs> I guess it's more timeless than a, a '60s style boy band. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. I I hadn't been thinking of that, but it's true. That that is um that movie does have like some of the few um you know, positive depictions of vultures in popular culture and. Yeah, definitely you should be commended for that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um I'm still disappointed that they didn't like use them for the remake. Oh true, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, what can you do? Right. I mean, I, you know, I can get on my soapbox about those remakes in the first place, but uh, <laughs> this is not the place to do so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> they are just wonderful birds. Absolutely. All right. Well, we can continue our journey through this um, phylogeny then. Um, so the next group uh, we have here is uh, the Aquilines, or I call them booted eagles here. Um, so this is a group that can be considered the, the true eagles. So the genus Aquila means eagle. Um, and certainly in traditional kind of the traditional image of an eagle in Western cultures is probably of the golden eagle, which is, of course, a member of the genus Aquila. Um, so I think uh, you can consider the booted eagles to be kind of the, the core eagle group. Um, now, of course, thanks to um, kind of American iconography in these days, uh, I think most people might uh, more commonly associate even uh, the term eagle with the bald eagle. Um, however, the bald eagle is not a member of the booted eagle group. Uh, the bald eagle is a sea eagle, and we haven't gone to them yet. But uh, even so, uh, certainly a golden eagle has enjoyed a certain amount of popularity in popular culture. And mm-hmm. the Aquilian eagles, um, they, they span a, quite a wide range of sizes, um, but they're they're all you know quite powerful predators and uh, Things like the golden eagle are able to take down like prey larger than themselves. Um, there are several confirmed reports um, of um, golden eagles taking down things like uh, deer, like and I, I don't mean like fawns, like adult deer, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, pronghorns, and we are uh, sometimes called pronghorn antelope, even though they're not antelope. Um, yeah, and other uh, kind of you know moderately large uh, hoofed mammals like that. Um, yeah, they'll also go after foxes and things. So, uh, in fact, I, I didn't mention this at the title slide, but the title slide I used for this um, this um, episode is, shows a, a golden eagle feeding on a fox. Now, I don't know the exact a, um, a story behind that particular photo. I don't know if the the, the um, eagle killed the fox or if it's scavenging, but um, nonetheless, um, being able to prey on foxes is not an unusual event for a golden eagle. Um, and of course, quite uh, famously, um, there are. Um, people in central asia for who um who hunt using uh, golden eagles and um you know they go after all kinds of prey but uh quite uh, notably they use the golden eagles to hunt wolves like jeez 
That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, to be fair, not all wolves are equally big. Like, um, the, the wolves out there in Central Asia are a bit smaller than, say, a timber wolf. Um, but nonetheless, they're, they're still quite a bit bigger than the eagles. And um, some some people will say, like, oh, well, no, the, the eagle is just there to, to hold the wolf down while the human comes along and kills the wolf. And sure, that, that happens. But uh, the eagles are certainly capable of bringing down the wolves by themselves under some conditions. Um and yeah, like in in the wild, um, eagles probably wouldn't wouldn't go after wolves like much if, if ever. But uh, they certainly can be trained to do so and can be effective at doing it. So yeah, these are some of the most powerful um, avian predators there are um, belonging to this group. Um, and in fact, the largest eagle ever is a member of this group. But we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, the next group are the accipiter hawks, and uh, they are. They are quite an interesting group. Um, so these hawks are often called a uh, bird hawks because they specialize in hunting other birds. And so um, they take a quite a different uh, hunting strategy uh, compared to some of the others. Um, so uh, they, they are a bit more, I don't know, they're a bit like ninjas, I guess. So they often hunt in like these very, you know, tightly packed, dense, dense uh, forested environments um, where there are other birds hanging around. And then they are able to chase their prey uh, very quickly and uh, with high maneuverability through the foliage. Um, I've seen several videos of people um, uh, basically uh, sending a, a goshawk, a goshawk is a kind of accipiter hawk, um, one of the largest ones, uh, sending a goshawk through basically an obstacle course. So they basically built like an obstacle course with like all these little tubes and like these narrow spaces. And, and they had the hawk like fly through all these spaces to get to the food at the end. And yeah, the hawk was able to perform it flawlessly. And uh, like it would uh, squeeze through it, like it, it would fold up its its wings at all the right moments to get through the cracks and then spread them again to keep flying. And yeah, it, it's quite incredible. And there, I've also seen another video, which was um, a camera that was mounted on a, uh, on a goshawk hawk and uh, they showed it as like, just flying through the forest and weaving through the trees and yeah it's quite incredible to think of what what these birds can do like just chasing other birds through the through these very tough to navigate environments um and so there, there are quite a few um um commonly seen uh, species of accipiter hawks in many parts of the world um many of them have learned to you know come to bird feeders so um the bird feeder becomes a bird feeder in more ways than one um so you not only get the birds coming to eat the seeds but also the birds that want to eat the birds eating the seeds so um yeah um i know um people often get upset over uh, hawks visiting feeders um well yeah i understand i understand um but i guess one one thing is you know the hawks have to eat too if a hawk starts hanging around your feeder and you know uh, it, it is fine to take down the feeder for for a week or so or you know however long it takes um and you know the the normal seed eating birds that you get they will be able to find food somewhere else and once the um hawk notices that they're no longer gathering there they'll it'll, it'll move on and you know, find its food somewhere else so if you don't want to like see hawks doing their thing like in your backyard then that you know it, it's, it's perfectly fine to like uh, stop the feeding for you know a short time and uh that that everybody you know do their do their thing somewhere where you can't see it. <laughs> um, uh, but but yeah, they are still a very um, you know I I think they're they're still very respectable predators, and uh, very amazing if you get to know them. Now in uh, in North America, the two most uh, commonly seen species are the Cooper's hawk and the Sharpshinned hawk. Um, the Sharpshinned hawk is a bit smaller, but uh, they are pretty difficult to tell apart. Um, and uh, I, I've definitely seen both species um, on occasion. Have you? Uh, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I know I, I used to get upset about this because, <laughs> I mean, I, I could not tell a sharp shin from a <laughs> right. And I, I think I asked you like years ago. And uh -huh. it's all about size. And it's like, okay, that's helpful when there's like, when they're like, you know, both there. <laughs> right, right. But that usually doesn't happen all that much. So right. it's like, I, I, it's, it's still up in the air after all these years, whether yeah. I saw one or the other um but i mean it was still like it was a wonderful experience because uh, i see a lot of different hawks and, and things around mm -hmm. here i rarely see like those types yeah you know, yeah that, that, that spotted plumage um, so, right like that first time i saw it it just like stuck out to me i'm like oh wow this is a really you know pretty bird yeah and 
I don't know when I'm ever going to get a chance to see another one. And mm-hmm. To this day, like I, I rarely had another opportunity to see either species. I right, guess. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, even though even though they're not rare across most of their range, like they're they're a bit more you know secretive than a lot of the larger um, raptor species. Like, uh, even though they they are capable of soaring, but they mostly do that on migration. Like you, you you're not going to as commonly see them just you know, flying up in plain sight uh, high uh, in the clear sky or uh, perched out on somewhere very prominent. Like usually they're, they're kind of, they're kind of staying out of the way where, you know, other birds can't notice them. And then, so they can ambush them when they have the chance. So yeah, they're, they're a bit more low key than some of the other raptors. Um, I, yeah, I, I did see um, both species occasionally, especially uh, Coopers um, in the, um, when I was living in Maryland and, and yeah, they, they are difficult to tell apart, uh, Coopers is, is bigger, but yeah, like you said, a size is very hard to judge in the field. There are a few other tricks you can keep in mind to try and tell them apart, like the, um, the, um, the Coopers coloration, where it has a notably uh, darker top of the head, so it's like kind of like wearing a cap, whereas the um, in the uh, sharpshinned, like the dark, the dark um, gray kind of extends further down across the rest of its body, so it doesn't have a clear kind of demarcation there. Um, mm. And also the, um, the sharpshinned tends to have a more square shaped tip of the tail, whereas in the Coopers, it's more rounded. Um, yeah, so those are some of the main ways to, to tell them apart. But um, e- even then, I know it, it, it can be really, really hard. I definitely more than once I've, I've had sightings where I wasn't sure which one it was. Um, but yeah, it usually takes a good light and a good view and, you know, good, very good viewing conditions. But nonetheless, uh, they, they are out there. So, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Um, there was a there was a particularly memorable sighting that I once had when I was uh, just taking you know one of my usual routes across campus, and then walking along and then I passed under some trees and then I noticed a down feather float down like onto the ground in front of me, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Don't see that every day. And then I looked around and started noticing like more and more of these like down feathers just drifting to the ground and there was a, this flurry of feathers, and so I then I. I started having an inkling of what was going on. So I turned and looked up into the trees and, and yep, there was an exceptor hawk having lunch right there. It was plucking another bird that it had caught. Um, and so that's why the feathers were coming down and yeah, it made a successful yeah. kind of kill. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely another really cool raptor sighting. Um, now there is one particular group um, of um, raptors in the um, exceptrines that uh, don't hunt like this. Um, and those are the harriers. And so the harriers are a group uh, with like these really long, broad wings, and they tend to fly um, low over open habitats and soaring without flapping their wings. And so very different from kind of forest dwelling habit that most of the other exhibitors have. And um, the harriers, um, they'll fly over these open habitats, often with like long grass. And then if they notice something below, they'll drop down and catch it. Um, they have a little um, ruff of feathers around their face, which makes them look a little bit owl-like. And probably like owls, they seem to hunt a little bit using their um, hearing. Um, so they're able to hear for prey items that are moving around in the grass below. Um, so that's a, that's pretty interesting. But it, it is it is quite odd that they are embedded in this clade of mostly like forest-dwelling uh, predators that mostly hunt other birds. So yeah. All right, and finally we get to the uh, Budio hawks and the sea eagles and their kin, and these are the Butionine raptors. Um, so the Budio hawks are like your basically classic red-tailed hawk um, and its uh, close relatives. So these kind of mid-sized raptors, uh, they mostly um, mostly forage by soaring high over the sky. Uh, oftentimes when it's uh, not prime time for soaring, you'll see them perched out on high perches, just uh, waiting for the thermals to be just right. Um, now, um, kind of confusingly, um, in Europe, uh, the members of the genus Budio um, are called buzzards. And so here in the UK, for example, we have the common buzzard. Um, hmm. um, however, in the States, the name buzzard is often used for turkey vultures, which are, of course, a completely different group. Um, and whereas the Budio um, raptors are called hawks in North America. So uh, there's a little bit of kind of confusion that goes on there. but. Basically, the European buzzards, Eurasian buzzards, are close relatives of the um, red-tailed hawk and its kin, and are not, you know, they don't have anything much to do with, like, turkey vultures. Um, interestingly, uh, the sea eagles are also closely related to Butionines, uh, or they are Butionines, and they're closely related to Butio hawks. Um, so uh, sea eagles, of course, includes, like, the 
national symbol of the United States, the bald eagle, um, but also includes various other kind of fish-eating eagles, like the African fish eagle and the stellar sea eagle and the white-tailed sea eagle. And a lot of them, they can be found in, uh, you know, pretty much across most of the world uh, where there's water on coastlines and large rivers and large lakes and so on. And as their name suggests, they hunt mostly fish, although um, bald eagles are quite opportunistic. So they'll, they'll scavenge when they can. They also steal food from other raptors, especially ospreys. So they'll have the osprey do the hard work first and then kind of harass the osprey until it drops the fish. Um, and they'll even hunt like other birds sometimes, especially in winter when the ponds are mostly iced over. Uh, they will uh, go after things like ducks and geese and catch them. So, uh, you know, they're mostly fish eaters, but they, they can do a lot of things and can be fairly good at all of them. Um, and finally, um, there are also a group called the uh, Milvine Kites uh, that belong to the Butionines. Uh, so the Milvine Kites are also called kites, like the Ilanin Kites. But uh, as you can see on, on here, uh, they're not especially closely related. Um, and Milvine kites include things like, uh, they're mostly found in the old world, so things like the black kite and the red kite. Um, the red kite is a species that can be seen here in the UK, and some parts uh, here is quite common. I've seen them before, and they are spectacular. And like the Ilanin kites, they are very good uh, at flying without flapping their wings, so they just kind of hang in the air like kites. Um, and uh, they are... They're, ecologically, they're they're a little different from the Ilanins. Like the Ilanins, you know, they're they're kind of like small prey hunters that catch uh, insects and also small prey on the ground um, as they as they fly. Whereas the the um, Milvine kites are more scavenging birds. Uh, so they, even though they are capable of hunting, they are they are you know also major uh, scavengers. You know, in, in that respect, uh, if you if you actually look at a Milvine kite and a sea eagle side by side, uh, you you can see that they they actually do have they do bear resemblance to one another and of course the ecologically the kind of common commonly scavenging habit is something that they also share um and i yeah i've also seen them um, yeah, i've seen red kite here i've seen a black kite in japan um and i've seen a brahmini kite in uh, australia so in, in many of parts of the world where they are uh, where they are found they are they are fairly commonly seen and they are quite spectacular to to view um but interesting enough the uh, red kite was once um extirpated from the UK and they are, the current populations have been reintroduced successfully. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a conservation success story. But uh, do you have anything to add about any of these groups? Well, certainly talk, you talk about conservation success stories. I remember when the bald eagle was taken off the endangered species. That's list. right. Yes. Hmm. And like over the years, like I was actually able to see more of them than I usually did. Yeah. Like yeah. growing up, like I did not see bald eagles a right. lot, if ever. Maybe like one or two hmm. like points over like a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And then it became like almost yearly I would see them. Right. And they're one of those birds where I can't go out and look for them. Yeah. I'm always doing something else and then they just happen <laughs> to show up. Right, right. Like we'll be driving somewhere and then it'll just like pass a tree line mm -hmm. or we'll be rounding a corner and it's there in the distance. There was one, like probably the, the, the best, well, not, not the best, one of the best experiences I had was we were driving and I see this huge mass of turkey vultures <laughs> soaring as they do around mm -hmm. something in the field. Yeah. And then on top of all of them was this one bald eagle that was just checking out the thing. <laughs> That's cool. And I'm like, yeah, they, um, I know, like, they're not, they, like, of course, if, if you know anything about bald eagles, like, they're not exactly the nicest birds. <laughs> because, right. like, you know, they have a habit of, like, taking kills from other birds. Right. Rather than, you know, going through the effort of catching it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, which is always funny to me, because I know, like, at, at least in private, you know, Benjamin Franklin advocated for the wild turkey. Right, so right. The American symbol yeah. versus the bald eagle. But, you know, like, again, this is all in private. Right. You know, like, well, people mention that this fact without mentioning that. So, like, you, you have him thinking, like, he's out there with picket fences. <laughs> right. Going, you know, we want the turkeys. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, yeah, like, uh, uh, the most from, like, these, you know, you know these last three groups is the, that I see a lot is the red-tailed hawk. Mm, yeah, um, for sure. You know, like they hang out on perches. Yeah, like we pass by a lot of farm fields when we drive. And so usually on the on the fence posts, there's always one or two mm. just hanging out. And occasionally I'll see them kind of like bobbing and weaving over the grass yeah. as if like they're, they're, they found something and they're trying to track it. Right, right. Um, 
But yeah, that's probably the most common um, raptor besides the turkey vulture yeah. that I see around here. Yep. And then they're, they're pretty in their own way, too. Mm -hmm. The general rule uh, when you're birding in North America, if you see a hawk, is like, is it not a red-tailed hawk? And if you, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, if you can eliminate that option, then you can consider like other species. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I definitely definitely saw red tails pretty often uh, when I was in Maryland. Like there there was one that would, I, I think probably a mated pair, but usually I saw one at a time uh, that would always perch on these big um, the big lamps on the side of the sports stadium, um, and uh, I I did also see um, bald eagles occasionally um, in Maryland, but not super often. Uh, and yeah, most mostly it was a very very much an unpredictable kind of thing. Like I would just be randomly walking places. And, oh, there's a there's a bald eagle up there. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of funny because there there was one time I was just you know again taking my usual routes to and from classes and then so and because I'm I'm always uh, you know looking out for birds around me. I I saw a bald eagle just flying up there, and uh, it seemed like no one else passing by had noticed. And it was like this footpath with a bunch of people. It was just like come on guys, look up, look up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um. Yeah. Um, now, I, I did used to, um, you know, further back <laughs> in my ontogeny, I, uh, I did used to live in um, um, Vancouver uh, in Canada, and uh, Pacific uh, Northwest is, is, of course, a great place for uh, bald eagles. So I did see them a bit more often um, over there. And yeah, a conservation success story for sure. All right. Now, uh, let's look at the fossil record of exhibitrids then. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go uh, roughly group by group. Um, so here we have uh, fossils of the Japatine vultures. So these are the inventive vultures, as uh, Joan just coined. Um, and so something interesting about this group is that a lot of their fossils are not found in Africa or even Eurasia, uh, where they live today, but in North America. So in North America, uh, even all the way into the Pleistocene, we had species like Neofrontops, um, which actually, uh, this genus is actually known from several species, from the Miocene all the way to the Pleistocene, um, all living in North America. And uh, yeah, there were, there were some, um, some other uh, uh, Pleistocene uh, uh, Japatines um, around in North America too. So again, we got like this huge diversity of cathartids or new world vultures. We had the teratorns, and now we had like these several species of like japatine vultures all coexisting in in North America during the Pleistocene. Like, wow, <laughs> what a raptor heaven! Um, now, if we do have um, a very nice um, japatine fossil from the Miocene of China, uh, and that is Myoneofron, um, which is known from a, a, a formation that has increasingly um, been very productive for a uh, bird fossils and you can see on the uh, right here that it has this uh, essentially complete skeleton known um, now on the diagram on the um, right you can see some of the bones are grayed out and those bones are probably like um, faked or like embellished by um, you know someone <laughs> who had uh, held on to this fossil for a bit and decided to uh, add some parts to it to make it look even more complete than it actually was oh. but uh, yeah but uh you know even the parts that are genuine you know put together make a pretty damn complete skeleton um and so both the uh, neofron tops and my neo neofron seem to have been pretty similar to like the egyptian vulture of today and if you look at the restoration like behind the skeleton of neofron tops here uh, it is basically based on like a living uh, egyptian vulture so quite interesting how we used to have them around uh do you have anything to add uh, no, not really. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, so the Egyptian vultures, the uh, core group of old world vultures, um, are also known from fossils from like the Miocene onwards, but uh, mo most of them are a bit more fragmentary and more poorly known. But from the same site as a uh, Myoneofron, we do have uh, this this one, Gonsu Gyps, uh, which is also known from an essentially complete skeleton. Um, on the next slide, uh, I have a much more recently extinct species. Uh, so this was the Haas eagle of New Zealand, and it was the biggest eagle that we know of of all time. Um, so, you know, as we've spoken of before, New Zealand in recent times, you know, prior to human um, arrival there, uh, was basically a land of birds. Like it was one of the few places in the world, in the in the Cenozoic, where birds were the largest uh, animals of their ecosystem, and they they kind of uh, took up the role of the giant herbivores and the giant carnivores. And so, of course, uh, some of the most famous um, known and the biggest uh, uh, herbivores on the island were the moa, which we spoke of before when we talked about paleonates. 
Um, but as big as they were, like even the giant species of moa had to beware of a predator, and that was the host eagle. Um, and so the host eagle, I think, estimated the females, because females are bigger, uh, like in most raptors, um, could weigh up to like about 15 kilograms. Uh, so um, about the size of a velociraptor, <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, it had these you know, huge talons. Like uh, you can look on the, the left here, the scale bar is five centimeters. So you're like, God, yeah, those, those, are, <laughs> those are big, big talons and big feet. Um, <laughs> and we have found a, a kind of marks where these eagle talons uh, would leave behind in the hip bones of moa the pelvis um where these uh these eagles probably lashed on to the to the moa and while they were trying to kill them um so um much like um how um golden eagles can hunt a relatively large kind of herbivorous mammals today uh, probably the way that this hoss eagle hunted uh, moas was kind of similar was it, it would cling on to them on onto their backs with its talons and then kind of uh, uh, just keep holding on until while well, while the its prey was trying to shake it off and so it's kind of a variant of the RPR behavior the raptor prey restraint behavior except it's going after like prey that's much bigger than itself. Um, some people have suggested that maybe it would also use its other foot or its its beak to go after the head while it was riding on the on the moa. Um, but either way, uh, we do have like direct fossil evidence that it preyed on them, and so yeah, absolutely impressive predator it must have been. Um, now, uh, in terms of its um, its wing size, it's interesting because it, its wing size was not especially big considering how big the rest of its body was. So it seems like uh, its wings were adapted to kind of uh, flying through forests and such, which makes sense because New Zealand has quite a lot of forests. So even though it was like this huge eagle, it could probably like you know. It probably had some agility and was able to like weave through the forested areas in while it was pursuing its prey. Um, now, of course, um, once uh, humans arrived, well, we don't know exactly when the host eagle went extinct, but uh, you know, probably in historical times and quite likely uh, with uh, or shortly after the extinction of the moa. And it is likely that you know human hunting of moa um, you know, took away its main food source and uh, drove it to extinction. Um, I guess something else notable is that certainly the host eagle, if it could kill a giant moa, it certainly was big enough to kill a human. Um, and now there is no direct evidence of the host eagle having ever preyed on humans, but you know, I I I have to imagine that it happened at least once. Um, and if it did, I imagine humans wouldn't be very uh, um, fond of it. <laughs> um, so uh, I, you know, it's speculative, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was some you know direct human killing of these birds as well. Mm. Um, something quite surprising about the Haas eagle is that uh, in recent years, uh, you know, it has been included in genetic um, phylogenetic analyses. And it turns out, well, its uh, closest living relative lives in Australia, which is not so much of a surprise because Australia is so close to New Zealand. But uh, its closest living relative is a species called the little eagle, which is, you know, one of the smallest eagles in the world, <laughs> as its name suggests. <laughs> So that is really ironic. Um, and in fact, the little eagle and the Haas eagle has been estimated through a molecular clock that probably shared a common ancestor uh, about 2.5 million years ago. And so it, you know, if, the, if the ancestral condition was something close to the size of a little eagle, it, it became like the biggest eagle ever in only like less than 2 million years. So that is quite, quite a remarkable rate of evolution. Um, so yeah, definitely an absolutely spectacular animal. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'd love to see one of these in life, but I, I also know that, you know, it, it would be a potentially dangerous animal. And uh, in some ways, I, I imagine people are relieved that it's no longer around. Um, so, yeah, would be cool, though. <laughs> oh, I agree. It is interesting, like, to think about, like, the human, the possible human relationship right. with this bird. I mean, based on what I've read, like, humans who live in contact with large predators, like lions or bears they've usually figured out ways to, to deal with them right without necessarily wiping them out mm -hmm. although yeah i guess that is debatable depending on how, how you feel about the megafauna extinction. that's true yeah um but uh yeah it, uh, that is a very good question um i mean yeah like, like you said like i i it would be interesting if this bird sought to include, you know, these these new arrivals in its diet. Right. Um, 
I mean, usually, like, that doesn't... Usually that's not the case that I find with, with, with lots of large predators. Like, even lions, mm -hmm. like... Lions don't make, you know, meals of humans all that much. Um, it, it's more of circumstances of, of these interactions. Mm. So, yeah, I guess it is a good question. Yeah. Um, what exactly happened? Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, the fears, whether they were warranted or not, of this bird mm. may have led, you know, the, the New Zealanders to... Oh, sure, yeah. Wipe them out. I mean, I, I just think about what happened with the, um, the the European colonists on Eastern North America. Right. Uh, they, they made quick work of all the cougars and, and wolves. Uh, and, yep. Mm. So, like, there's... There's that aspect of it, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting to think about. I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree. Um, and there, there is, in fact, a, a bird from a Maori mythology that might correspond to the Haas eagle. It, like, uh, it's, I think it's called the Pukai, uh, which is supposed to be this, like, this giant uh, raptor that uh, allegedly hunted humans. So, you know, there may be something to that. Um, hmm. You and... know what? That's interesting because... Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. In Moana... Yes. Uh, in, in... I think I think Maui turns into right a Haas eagle at a couple points. Yeah, yeah, or, or very likely to be based on one. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. His uh, his giant um, giant hawk slash eagle form is, yeah, I I think it's I think it's meant to be like uh, based on the pukai slash the Haas eagle. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So I think somebody did like a comparison with it was like a museum. I guess, I, I guess that's another thing too about the Haas eagle, like it, its actual like depiction. Because hmm. I know a. Growing up, uh, the Macmillan Encyclopedia and, and related books, they would have it as like a giant Philippine eagle. Yeah, yeah. Or like a giant harpy eagle or something like that. But right. I guess with what we, what, what, with what little we know about its, um, you know, evolutionary history, like it probably looked more like a, you know, like like a golden eagle or something. Right, like that. right. But uh, I know there's, there's one museum that has like a very like iconic like color scheme mm -hmm. to this bird, and people have like took that. And they've looked at like the design for Maui's eagle form, and it's like, huh, you know, yeah. <laughs> right, right, well, yeah. I, I'd love to uh, kind of pick the, the the designer who did that, and, and like, did you did you do that on purpose? Right, or right, yeah. I, I I'm curious too. <laughs> but yeah, while I'm here, um, uh, I'll mention this uh, because you, yeah, you mentioned the comparison to golden eagles, which reminded me. Um, so the the Haas eagle used to be given its own genus, uh, Harpagornis. Um, but of course, with the recent genetic studies, we now know it is actually nested um, as the closest relative to the um, little eagle, which is in the genus Heraetus. And so that's why it is currently now classified in the genus Heraetus. Um, but <laughs> there are, um, in addition, uh, genetic studies have also suggested that the genus Heraetus is itself nested in the genus Aquila. Um, and so it may be that eventually uh, Heraetus will be sunk into Aquila and will have Aquila Mori for the scientific name of the Haas eagle. So uh, yeah, that's a, uh, we'll see how the state of things uh, moves on that front. Oh yeah. The Haas eagle is indeed a true eagle, is a member of the booted eagle group. Um, but uh, there were other kinds of large raptors on New Zealand as well, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, so there is Isles' Harrier. Now, uh, the extinct uh, Isles' Harrier on New Zealand uh, was much smaller than the Haas eagle. It was about uh, three kilograms, but even so, it was much larger than any, any of the living uh, Harriers. And so it, it probably like kind of occupied like the mid-sized predator niche where it was going after like moderately large birds, but not not the giant moa. Um, it, it is also um, it has also been um, included in phylogenetic analyses and is found to be closely related to harriers that live in um, in Australia today. So probably uh, quite quite a similar evolutionary history where probably uh, uh, several several individuals got blown off to, to New Zealand and then just decided, hey, uh, you know, we're the biggest and baddest things here now, except for the giant eagle. So uh, we can we can grow big. Um, and uh, another interesting kind of. Recently extinct island-dwelling harrier is the uh, Hawaiian harrier uh, from the uh, Hawaiian Islands. And something really odd about this harrier species. Um, so um, uh, in the image on the right here, uh, the comparison bones, for, for each set of bones you see here, the one in the middle is the extinct uh, Hawaiian harrier. So on the rightmost side is the upper arm bone or humerus. In the middle is the one of the forearm bones, the ulna. And in the... Um, 
uh, on the right here is the um, carpal metacarpus or um, the, the palm and the uh, wrist. Um, and the leftmost bone in each comparison is a uh, living harrier species. And the rightmost bone in each comparison is an accipiter hawk species. So you can see here that the uh, Hawaiian harrier had proportions of bones that were more similar to bird hawks, or like accipiter hawks, than to the other harriers, which is pretty interesting. So uh, of course Hawaii was also a kind of land of birds uh, back before uh, human contact, um, and so most of the prey items on, available on the island would have been other birds that were living in the dense forests. So it seems that the Hawaiian harrier kind of evolved back into a, an accipiter-like form and became a forest hunter again. Uh, and you know, basically did what acceptor hawks do um, on in other places. Um, yeah, quite remarkable because, yeah, ancestrally, acceptatrines were probably bird hawks and then they evolved into harriers and then this harrier evolved back basically into a bird hawk-like ecology. Um, the, the name of the Hawaiian harrier is quite interesting. So, um, so circus is the genus for all um, harriers, but uh, docinus apparently means clown in Latin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the reason for this uh, this name is partly because it's a pun and because genus circus goes with clowns, but also because um, basically when the paleontologists who were studying this uh, species first found the bones, they automatically assumed it was a bird hog. It was an accipiter. Um, and so when they finally realized it was a harrier, they were like, oh, it played a trick on us. So we're going to call it the clown harrier, basically. Um, so that's a pretty... Um, pretty fun uh, story, um, uh, co-authored by the late uh, Storrs Olsen, who passed away earlier this year, a very well-known uh, fossil bird researcher. Um, you know, he had some uh, controversial views, but uh, for whatever you can say about him, he definitely wasn't uncreative. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, if you're wondering what the name circus actually means, it, it is not meant to mean like an actual circus. Um, it is apparently named after um, a hawk mentioned in uh, Greek myths that would fly in circles. So circus, uh, yeah, so that, that's where the name comes from. But it does go well with the, with this name that they chose for this extinct species. Um, do you have anything to add to this? It's like, gosh, we could we could do a whole show on like the, just the, the Greek inspirations alone. For yeah, all these, right. These names, because oh my gosh, it's just this that's just fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like why people name things the way they do. Yeah, that, that's a that's a fascinating subject. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so these are some um, Buteonine hawks um, that uh, that are known from the fossil record and kind of um, not to be outdone by the by the Haas seagull. Uh, several of the Buteonines actually grew to quite gigantic sizes. And so, for example, Amplibutio, uh, Woodward eye, sometimes called a Woodward's eagle, even though it's actually a Buteonine hawk, um, from the Pleistocene of Cuba in North America, uh, or at least the U.S., um, it could get like almost the size of a hoss eagle. Like it was, it was big. It was big, and it was another one of these Pleistocene raptors that's been found in like the La Brea tar pits. So again, you know, what do we have now? Like we have a bunch of cathartids, we have uh, teratorns, we have some of the uh, Japatine vultures, and now we have this gigantic hawk that all lived um, in the Pleistocene of North America in the same ecosystem. Like what the heck? What the heck? I'd love to. I'd love to visit the Pleistocene, you know, California, and see all these birds. Like holy crap. Um, and we're not done yet because the one in the middle here, uh, Buteo gallus dagati, was another species that has been found in La Brea tar pits. Um, so this species appears to have been closely related to a modern uh, species from South America called the savannah hawk, which is a, a kind of mid-sized um, raptor. Now on the uh, on the right in the comparison here uh, is a is a foot bone from the uh, savannah hawk, and on the um, on the left is this uh, Buteo gallus dagati, sometimes called a daggett's eagle. Um, and so you can see that the, the Daggett's eagle was a, quite a big bird, but not only that, but the proportions of its hind limbs are actually quite long. And so uh, it seems to have been one of these um, raptors that would primarily stalk prey around on the ground, like almost like a secretary bird. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty odd. Um, in fact, um, when I visited the um, San Diego Zoo many years back, they had this uh, section of the zoo, which was basically, it, it was a pretty interesting premise. So it, they exhibited animals that, um, you know, are either like um, closely related to species that used to live in California but are now extinct there, or you know are ecological counterparts to those animals. And so they had an exhibit on the um, 
uh, for uh, secretary birds, which is one of the places, one of the few places where I've seen you know, live secretary birds. Um, and the secretary bird was meant to be a stand-in for this Daggett's eagle uh, as an ecological analog. And they also had a statue of a Daggett's eagle kind of next to the exhibit there. So that was, uh, that was pretty neat. <laughs> That's such a cool idea. Right, right. I kind of like that a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. And of course, they had their California condors there, and they, they exhibited also elephants, they, you know, because of mastodons and mammoths, and they, they had uh, uh, guanacos because of camelids, uh, uh, tapers, and capybaras, and yeah, all, all those guys. Um, let's see. And then finally, on the leftmost side, uh, a bit older than these other two, uh, from the, this one is from the Pliocene of Italy, is a Gargano Aedes. Um, it lived on the island of Gargano. It's, it was, it's part of Italy now, but it's, it was like an island at the time. Um, and uh, this was a species I could grow to about the size of a golden eagle, so not, not quite as big as a host eagle, but uh, he's still a pretty damn big uh, raptor. Um, and yeah, Gar Gargano is an interesting ecosystem, and in fact, I'll, I'll say more about it in a later slide. Um, but yeah, basically the top predators there were these giant raptors. And finally, some miscellaneous uh, raptors on the next slide. So we also have uh, also another very big raptor is Gigantohyrax from the Pleistocene of Cuba, specifically uh, Gigantohyrax um, suarezi, uh, which is also you know roughly the size of a hoss eagle. Um, the second species of Gigantohyrax, which was named uh, last year, is a bit smaller, but still pretty big for a raptor. Um, and this, it's known from the Pleistocene of Cuba, both of these species. Uh, so that's in the middle there. Uh, on the left, we have a, a Pato Sagittarius uh, terrinus, um, and this is a, a raptor from the Miocene of North America. Um, and it also seems to have been a secretary bird-like uh, raptor, but um, the proportions of its toes suggest that it, it was an accipitrid and not closely related to a secretary bird. So again, we have another secretary bird mimic that, that used to live in North America. And so pictured there is the, the foot, the tarsa metatarsus, which is really long with the toes attached to one end. Um, and finally, uh, from the Oligocene to Miocene of Australia, we have a species called Pingana, which is not known from many bones. Like the, the bone in the middle here is like a, is like a fragment of its uh, shin bone, the, the tibiotarsus. Um, and so this is where the, uh, the, the tip of the bone would form part of the ankle joint, basically. And to either side of it, uh, you can see comparisons with uh, two modern species of a uh, raptor. And so one of these is the African harrier hawk that I mentioned earlier. And the other one is called uh, the crane hawk from South America. And these two are not closely related, but they do share the ability to, uh, you know, flex the ankles in a double jointed manner. And uh, people have looked at basically the ankle joints of these birds and tried to figure out, you know, what is it about their anatomy that allows them to do this. It turns out um, seemingly not a whole lot, but they do have like much narrower kind of, you know, these knobs at the end of the uh, the, the shin bone uh, are much narrower than in a typical um, uh, raptor. And so it seems that a pingana, even though it was uh, bigger than these two other species, uh, it also had these like relatively narrow kind of uh, knobs at the end of its shin bone and might have also had this ability to flex the, um, the ankle in a double jointed way uh, and probably had a similar kind of feeding style. Uh, all right, um, I said earlier that um, uh, the early fossil record of Exhibitrids is not so great, but uh, we do have this uh, nearly complete skeleton from the Oligocene of Poland, and that is Aviraptor. I actually mentioned this one uh, during our um, uh, kind of 2020 roundup of uh, news stories. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was only named last year, um, and it is a very small raptor with these relatively long legs. It, it's about the same size as the smallest living hawks today, like the tiny hawk. Um, and uh, it is known from a time and place where uh, like early passeriform birds, early perching birds and hummingbirds have, have been found. Uh, so it is quite plausible that this was a, a bird specialist raptor uh, that lived at the time and hunted other birds. This is probably the best known like kind of early um, accipitrid fossil. Um, like pretty much all the other ones are like very fragmentary bits of bone. Um, and finally, on the next slide, there is a, a an unusual um, an unusual uh, raptor species uh, that has been named Horus ornis. It is known from the Eocene of Europe, specifically France, um, and it is not clear how it is related to like the modern raptors, like which modern raptor group it is most closely related to. But we do have a number of uh, its limb bones uh, that have been recovered. And uh, like Pingana and like um, uh, the African Harrier Hawk and like the Crane Hawk, uh, it also has features of its shin bone that seem to indicate uh, it had a double jointed ankle. Um, it was a relatively small bird, so it's like around the size of some of the smaller hawks today. 
Um, but yeah, we were not quite sure what type of raptor it was. But still, uh, it does show that there were uh, some ecologically specialized raptors that were around in Europe at this time. Okay, I think the next slide will move on to owls. So do you have anything else left to add about uh, accipitriforms? forms? No, only that, I mean, it's an amazing group. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> but uh, all right, let's go to their uh, nocturnal counterparts, the owls, which are also a very amazing group. Um, owls do have a pretty good early fossil record in a sense. So there there are um, a lot of like um, species of fossil owls known from the Paleocene and the Eocene. But uh, most of them are very incomplete, so like there might be like individual foot bones and things like that. So you know, it, they don't tell us a whole lot about how a lot of these distinctive owl features evolved and things like that. Because owls are certainly very distinctive; you know them when you see them. Um, and a lot of the reason for this is because of their nocturnal habits, of course. Like there are some owls today that are active during the day, but by and large, they're nocturnally adapted hunters, and they can be found worldwide um, everywhere except for Antarctica. In fact, the um, the barn owl alone is found on every continent. Now, there has been some discussion of splitting the barn owl into several species, uh, so um, yeah, that, that might be a thing. But um, even so, uh, when it's considered a single species, the barn owl is another one of those candidates that is considered possibly one of the most widely distributed birds in the world. And, uh, you know, there are over 200 living species of owls, so that's comparable in diversity to the accipitriforms. Um, so they are certainly a very successful group. Now let's look at some of their uh, interesting features for uh, feeding at night. Um, so, of course, one of the most distinctive and most noticeable features is that they have this rough of feathers around their face, uh, forms a sort of flat disc that helps them localize sounds. And, um, you know, even though they have these big eyes to help them see in the dark, uh, it can, of course, be very helpful for them to also be able to hear their prey um, uh, as, they, as they hunt. And so uh, a lot of owls rely quite a bit on their hearing to be able to detect prey and catch them. Aiding in this um, is that the... Um, the, their ear anatomy is sometimes asymmetrical, and as I, I read about this, of course, you know, in books ever since I was a child. But uh, something I didn't really appreciate until I started reading like actual papers about um, bird anatomy is that uh, there are, owls um, have evolved different ways of making the ears asymmetrical in different owl groups. Um, so in some cases, the opening, the ear openings are uh, higher on one side than on the other. Um, and so this is the case in the barn owl, for example. Uh, and however, the underlying skull structure uh, is symmetrical. So it's only the ear openings, the soft tissues that are asymmetrical. But there are, there are also other, other owls where the underlying skull anatomy is asymmetrical, but the outside, the soft tissue anatomy is symmetrical, which I think is the case in like sawit owls. Uh, so that's weird. So I, I've seen like, you know, reproduced several times, like a picture of a skull um, of an owl showing like the asymmetry in the ear region. Yeah, that, that's, that doesn't happen to all owls with um, asymmetrical ears. And in many cases, um, even owls that have this sometimes have symmetrical soft tissue anatomy of the ears. Yeah, gets confusing. Um, and then there are owls where the, both ears are on the same level, but uh, one ear opening is bigger than the other. And um, then there are cases where uh, there, are, there are like, you know, these folds and flaps in the ear that are oriented differently on one side than on the other. So like they, they have a bunch of different ways of making the ear anatomy asymmetrical, um, but probably all for much the same purpose. And that is to further help them refine, um, you know, localization of sound so they can tell exactly where uh, every little rustle comes from when they're <laughs> hunting. Uh, and that makes them, of course, very deadly hunters uh, to, you know, small nocturnal animals. Um, also aiding them in this is that their flight tends to be especially um, silent. Uh, now, of course, if you know, if you have a super, super, super sensitive microphone, you can still pick up some sounds from the flapping of their wings. But, uh, you know, compared to other birds, they, their, their wing flapping is basically silent and you know, a regular human ear probably wouldn't be able to, to pick up those sounds. Um, like they, they have like uh, special, um, specially structured feathers and the texture of their feathers um, that seems to aid them in doing this. Um, and of course, uh, this is very helpful because it helps them uh, kind of sneak up on their prey and just, you know, bring down death from above. So yeah, owls are 
pretty amazing predators. Like they they have a satellite dish for a face, so you can, so they can find find their victims, uh, and then they just kind of stealth bomb them from the sky, uh, and and capture them. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I wouldn't want to be a small nocturnal animal in owl country. To capture their prey, they have semi zygodactyl feet. Uh, and we we saw this earlier with the osprey. So one of the the outermost toes, well, the outermost toe can also swivel backwards to to help them get a better grip. And so owls are specialized for killing relatively small prey by constricting with their toes. So I mentioned that most raptors will um, kill small prey by kind of squeezing the prey until it suffocates with the feet. And this is um, what owls are particularly specialized for doing. Um, so the toes are relatively short compared to other raptors, so they can squeeze with greater force. Um, but their um, their talons tend to be longer, and, and the reason for this is because so their toes are shorter, so they need more area um, to capture their prey with the talons. So they, the talons become longer in that respect, and then uh, form a very effective net for capturing their prey. And because their um, uh, one of their toes can swivel backwards, they can give gives them a very even grip on their prey so they can yeah just slowly choke the life out of their victims which is oof, not not much fun although um you know raptor prey restraint is no picnic either <laughs> right, it's like one or the other You're right right <laughs> yep so most owls they mostly hunt like your relatively small prey prey they can swallow whole um however the that's not to say like the really big owl species don't go after quite large prey like things like the uh, great horned owl in north america or the eurasian eagle owl um, in eurasia uh, they can go after some pretty big animals um like you know even including like other raptors there's a there's a very cool kind of camera um like a, a camera trap uh, video um showing like a, a group of uh, buzzards so i mean the Eur eurasian sense of buzzards like a group of hawks um nesting on a cliff so there are these young buzzards um and uh, they, they had they basically grown into their adult plumage so i i would guess they could they could probably fly even if only clumsily but um they were basically like adult sized and they were at night the camera took this footage at night and then you know they were nesting on the side of the cliff and then off in the distance in the darkness you just see this pair of eyes checking them out because like, it's <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, a lot of nocturnal animals have um, eye shine, right? So their their eyes are very reflective um, when, when light hits them. The light, uh, prob perhaps in the camera, or what, it, it's hard to say, um, showed, like, these glowing eyes in the darkness, like, behind the, you know, off in the distance behind the, this buzzard nest. And eventually you, you can see the, the eyes that kind of, kind of bobbing around, and then suddenly they get closer and closer and closer. And then an eagle owl just, just, you know, appears into view and grabs one of the young buzzards and takes off. And yeah, quite, quite an amazing video. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah, there's some, some owls can catch pretty big prey, but by and large are small prey specialists. Um, and like in Excipitriforms, the uh, females are usually bigger than the males, probably for similar reasons. The uh, females are primarily um, the, the main caretakers in terms of uh, nest defense. Uh, there are two major groups of living owls. So one group is barn owls and their kin, um, and the other groups are all the other owls, <laughs> the typical <laughs> owls, uh, as they're sometimes called. So titonids are the uh, barn owls and strigids are the, uh, the so-called typical owls. Um, they have some anatomical differences. For example, the barn owls tend to have relatively longer legs. They also have a comb-shaped claw on the, one of their uh, talons, the third claw. Um, where we talked about the comb-shaped claw, um, I think, last time, when we talked about herons and their relatives. Of course, this is convergent between the barn owls and the, the herons and co. But um, even so, uh, it, is, uh, it is probably uh, used for uh, kind of preening purposes, for combing uh, feathers. Um, and why other birds don't have this, uh, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it is a way to differentiate the barn owls from, uh, from the typical owls. Uh, yeah, something interesting is that, um, you know, there's a um, kind of um, young adult uh, fantasy um, novel series featuring owls called the... Um, Guardians of Gahul, uh, which has been made, yeah. Into, yeah, which has been made into a movie called The Legend of the Guardians, um, which is a pretty cool movie. Um, I think there are there are some things they did with it that I thought were pretty impressive. But in any case, um, the the um, kind of division between barn owls and typical owls is actually a plot point in that book series. Um, so, like some of the main kind of the main villainous group in the in the um, in the books um, 
are basically like titonid purists and so they, they think that um, the titonid owls are superior to all other kinds of owls and want to wipe the other owls out basically um yeah so uh, i i think that that series tried to incorporate like owl biology into the story with some mixed results but i, I do think it's pretty uh, pretty interesting that they that they manage to work like this kind of a, a biological division in there um and the last thing that I want to mention regarding owls is that, uh, of course, they have a reputation for being very wise and intelligent. Um, are they actually? Uh, well, owls are good at many things, but um, at least according to people who I've heard speak about working with owls, they are not especially intelligent by uh, bird standards. And in fact, I, I've, I have heard some rather unflattering things about um, their apparent cognitive abilities. So um, owls look like they're quite intelligent because they have you know, their big eyes, uh, forward facing eyes. Um, but uh, by bird standards, they're, as far as we know, they don't seem to be particularly smart. But still, they, they are very good at uh, doing the other things that they do. <laughs> I think it's funny that the strigids yeah. are called the typical owls yeah. because don't barn owls have like a worldwide distribution? <laughs> <laughs> barn owls do, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I, so do strigids. But um, yeah, I I don't think any single uh, strigid species uh, uh, has a worldwide distribution, whereas the barn owl, if you consider it one species, does. So yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny. The, the strigids are more diverse though, with more more species. So I guess it I don't know kind of balances out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess that makes sense too um <laughs> i will say i finally like after a decade yeah like sat down and watched the legends of the guardian oh yeah <laughs> um like not too not too long ago mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i was very impressed with it um in, in, in much the same way as, as you were talking about yeah yeah I, I i think it's definitely a very impressive in terms of like you know animating the birds and making them look like realistic without uh but also slightly anthropomorphizing them without like making them look too too uncanny i, I yeah i do quite like like the the art in, in that movie it's it's very good um yeah i'm kind of I'm <laughs> impressed like well one thing like i'm kind of disappointed that yeah it never picked up right I yeah mean, there were a lot of movies during that time right we're um, trying to do like oh the film versions of like this popular young adult franchise and they just never got off the ground mm -hmm. i mean yeah. a lot of them like probably for good reasons like the, they were not good at it <laughs> right right from what i understand like this one they took like with the first two or three books yeah i, I think they took the first three or so yeah and I, I thought it was you know considering that they, it was a pretty decent adaptation i felt um yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it overall, I, and I, yeah, it definitely is a shame that it, it didn't, it didn't get more. There, there were many more books in the, in the series that they could have adapted, um, and again, yeah, the even you know, just, just for the art alone, it is, it is absolutely impressive. I'm kind of impressed that because I know my, my aunt in Maine mm -hmm. reads these, the, the, oh, yeah? the, the warrior cats. Oh yeah, 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 I know about those. <laughs> I wonder, like, I, I've never read them, but I, I know them very well from her and from uh -huh. other places like that's that's one i've always kind of been surprised like they haven't tried to get that off the ground I you mean, know what yeah they, they made two adaptations of watership down so <laughs> right why has done this is it's it just fascinating to me it's like that is true that is curious yeah. you're right you're right I, i'm surprised too that, that warrior cats has never been made into a movie yeah it's certainly popular enough uh, I, I yeah i don't know <laughs> but uh but yeah in any case um it's a, it's definitely a very, very cool movie. Uh, uh, worth, worth checking out um, at least once. Um, but yeah, but people will still say you can't animate feathered dinosaurs, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um. Uh, right. <laughs> um, yeah. In terms of like personal experiences with owls, I don't have too many. Um, you know, they are they are secretive birds, so it's it's not that easy to see them most of the time. Um, but I did have a very memorable, um, uh, one of the, my most memorable sightings when I was, um, doing SVP in Australia was I spent a day, like just going birding with my supervisor and my lab mate. And, um, and at night, uh, we, we hired a guide to take us around to all the best birding spots. And, um, he took us to a place where he knew there were powerful owls nesting, so, you know, the largest, um, Australian owls. And we saw two, uh, young, powerful owls. Um, so they, they had, a you know they were they were fledglings so they they could they could kind of fly from branch to branch um but uh you can still tell that they were young birds like they were still kind of downy and fluffy but uh yeah they, that was that was a super cool sighting probably my favorite sighting of that day and there was a lot to pick from <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I've seen owls occasionally. Mm. Mostly, like, they'll be, like, sitting under a tree during the day, just right. resting. Probably the best experience I ever had was in Florida, visiting family. And we were driving from a gas station to go home. And there was, like, a large raised area, like a hilly, grassy area. Mm -hmm. And this owl swoops down, lands in the grass, seemingly grabs a small thing, huh. and just it goes right back into the trees. And wow. I was like whoa that is awesome <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> that is so cool i i love it <laughs> all right okay i guess we can go on to the next slide where we'll look at a few fossil owls so starting with some of the barn owls so um there are a few species of like giant barn owls in the fossil record that we know of um, that uh, lived on various islands. So they were basically the apex predators of those islands. And so one of these is the Bahaman giant barn owl with the, that lived during the Pleistocene um, in the Bahamas and Cuba. Um, how big was it? Well, uh, okay, so this this is this is kind of frustrating because the, these birds were were described in like relatively old literature like uh the bahaman giant barn owl was described in the 1930s and so the, these old papers um oftentimes they don't in include scale bars with their images like they would just sketch out the bone on the page and say i drew it in actual size and uh, <laughs> and it's like <laughs> Okay, but you didn't foresee that in the future people would look at these on digital <laughs> screens and then right. and then lose the context of the size. <laughs> so yeah, um, but um, from what can be compared, uh, the Bahaman giant barn owl was probably you know bigger than the biggest living owls today, like the eagle owl. So yeah, it was a big owl. Um, mm. And uh, similar in size to it uh, was a Taito gigantea from Pliocene of Italy. And this was one of the um, other, um, you know, apex predators of Gargano, that island I was mentioning earlier with, regarding Gargano aetis. Um, and so um, on, the, um, on the next slide, I actually show a picture of some of the animals that have been found in the um, Gargano ecosystem. And so special thanks to um, a, a user on DeviantArt named uh, Sanchius Art, or that's his username at least, um, who has uh, done like these lovely uh, restorations of some of these animals um, and put them to scale with each other. And you can see what a weird kind of ecosystem that this is. Um, so you have the giant raptors Gargano Aetis and Taito Gigantia as the kind of the apex predators of this island. Um, and then among the mammals, you have um, on the lower most um, left, uh, Dino Galarix, which is uh, basically a giant relative of um, hedgehogs. Um, Although it's actually more closely related to a group called the um, Gymnures, uh, which are uh, a group that no one has ever heard of, <laughs> but they are they are they are basically um, hedgehog relatives from Southeast Asia that don't have spines, and so they, they live a little bit like you know if you're North American think of similar to something like an opossum in terms of ecology, like they they wander around the forest floor and they they catch um, you know insects uh, and other small animals that they can eat, um, yeah kind of these uh, mid-sized uh, generalist predator. Um, there was also a, a giant pika, a relative of rabbits and hares, which is the next one to the right. Um, there was a giant um, rat <laughs> on this island, so good food for those giant raptors. Um, and also a giant a hamster and a giant dormouse. <laughs> so yeah, all these smallish mammals becoming huge on the island and then, and then say, oh crap, there are still raptors around here. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and then over next to the right is a species we've talked about on this podcast before, and that is um, Garganornis, a giant um, goose and duck relative, uh, probably one of the biggest uh, goose and duck um, relatives, or as in a natted, um, one of the biggest anatids ever to live. Um, so yeah, it certainly was uh, quite impressively sized. Um, it had these big knobs on its wings that might have been used to, to fight each other with, um, and it was uh, it was flightless. Um, so certainly it was big enough that probably the adults weren't bothered too much by uh, the giant uh, owl and hawk. Um, I might as well mention also that there there was also a. Um, a second species of Gargano aetis and a second species of barn owl um, on Gargano that were slightly smaller than the two pictured here, but still pretty big. So yeah, at, at least four kind of raptor species that these animals had to watch out for. Um, and finally, on the um, the rightmost side, um, uh, the rightmost side um, is um, are some uh, Hoplito mauricids. Um, uh, so one of the bigger species in Suva form, but also a smaller species as well. Um, and so these were a group of unusual hoofed mammals. Um, and uh, last I checked, it is debated 
like where they fall phylogenetically. Like it has sometimes been assumed that they're closely related to deer. But um, it has also been suggested that uh, they are closer to giraffes, maybe, or maybe they are equally close to all the living ruminants. So they kind of belong to kind of an early uh, branch, uh, early offshoot um, that, uh, you know, doesn't have close living relatives today. Um, so, yeah, it, it's still up in the air at the moment. But they have some unusual features, like they have these large canines. Uh, for some uh, some modern um, smallish um, hoofed mammals have large canines for fighting each other. Um, in addition, uh, they also, in some species at least, seem to have had five horns on their head. <laughs> they have two paired horns and then one in the middle. And oh God, like what was this for? Um, well, it has been speculated that they actually had this... Um, this headgear to help fight off giant raptors, basically. Um, because uh, these islands, as far as we can tell, were like fairly, so there, there were somewhat like arid um, habitats without a lot of tree cover. So, um, you know, anything that couldn't go down into a burrow uh, would have had to basically deal with predators by fighting them. Um, and <laughs> And so it has been suggested that, oh, you know, because golden eagles hunt deer by latching onto their backs, maybe uh, these um, these uh, gargano artiodactyls, these you know, gargano hoofed mammals, uh, fought off giant raptors by like using their their horned heads, kind of, they're throwing their horned heads backwards and and and, and uh, you know trying to headbutt them, uh, which is an interesting idea for sure, very hard to test, but uh, certainly it is plausible that these giant raptors would have certainly been a, a threat to well at least the, the hawks at least um, since um, owls tend to go for more swallowable prey, um, the gargano eaters <laughs> could have been a, a threat to at least smaller species species of hoplitomerics. So um, yeah, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Do you have anything to add to this? I also want to say that the, the prehistory of like Italy yes. and, and several Mediterranean islands doesn't get enough credit, I think, in the right. popular literature. Um, Absolutely. It's a bizarre collection of critters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this is not even the only such assemblage for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely agree because Europe used to be like, you know, this island archipelago and just like island archipelagos today, you get all kinds of weird stuff happening. And uh, as you can see very well here. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then on the next slide, I have some examples of extinct uh, strigids that are particularly interesting. So one of these is um, Ornimegalonyx, the biggest owl of all time, um, and uh, estimated it's probably standing, you know, perhaps up to a meter tall or something, which is wild. Um, it is known from the Pleistocene of Cuba. Um, Several species of Ornimegalonyx have been named, but a, a recent review suggested that only two species are valid. So the type species is Ornimegalonyx odoroi, and it's also the bigger species. And a second species was named in that recent paper, uh, and it's called um, Ornimegalonyx ewingi. And uh, the paper argued that these are the only two valid species of Ornimegalonyx. Um, and so Ornimegalonyx uh, coexisted with things like various giant rodents, um, also some ground sloths, um, and also various insectivorous mammals. Uh, like a group called the Selenodons, and so potentially all of these, um, at least the juveniles in the case of the slots, could have been prey for uh, Ornimegalonyx. Um, it has been suggested that it might have been uh, flightless, or at least had reduced flight capabilities, um, and that's because its, its wing bones seem to be shorter relative to its size compared to what we'd expect, so that's possible, but we don't have any like super complete uh, fossils to, to know for sure. And uh, on, the, um, on the right is a uh, uh, Growlistrix, the stilt owl. Um, so there are several species of stilt owl known from the different Hawaiian islands. Um, and so these are uh, comparing the bones of a stilt owl to a modern owl, the tawny owl, which is a you know a, you know average sized owl. And so on the um, left in the uh, comparisons here uh, are the bones of the stilt owl, and on the right is the tawny owl. And the stilt owl is not actually, you know, a bigger in overall body size than the tawny owl, but you can see that its hind limbs are much longer. So um, on the leftmost comparison, are, those are the thigh bones, which are about the same size in both species. But when you get to the next bone, which is the, the shin bones, the Grolistrix clearly has much longer hind limbs. And then the foot bone, the tarsum metatarsus, um, is also much longer in Grolistrix. Um, so what was it doing with these? Well, it seems... Uh, Grolistrix was uh, basically like the, um, the clown harrier that we mentioned earlier, uh, doing a kind of um, uh, what bird hawks would do. Um, so it's got these relatively short wings and relatively long 
uh, legs uh, to help it uh, kind of maneuver in the forest and snatch birds out of the air. And so it seems that uh, at least during the day, birds would have had to watch out for this um, the the weird Hawaiian harrier, and at nighttime they would have to contend with this um, stoat owl that, that would come chasing after them in the forest. So uh, yeah, another uh, very unusual set of island ecosystems. Um, anything you want to add? No, not particularly. Cool. All right. So let's see. Um, lastly, um, I want to show some uh, very early owls. So I mentioned earlier that owls actually have a very good uh, early fossil record. Um, and uh, they seem to have been very diverse, even as far back as the Paleocene. Um, Similarly for penguins, some people have argued that this indicates that maybe owls already were around in the Cretaceous period because they were like, you know, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, how could there be so so much diversity in the Paleocene? And well, you I, you know my thoughts on that. Uh, I just, I said it for the penguins. I, I said it in the first episode. So I'm I'm just gonna say I am skeptical. Uh, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that we couldn't have such a diversity of owls within you know like. Uh, Five million years of the of the after the extinction or so, um, so uh, yeah, but uh, most of these fossils are quite fragmentary, like individual bones and such. Um, but there are some exceptions uh, of well known early owls, and one of these is Paleoglox artiforon from the Eocene of Germany. Although recently there's been some question as to whether it really belongs to the genus Paleoglox. Um, this is known from the Messel formation, which is where many lovely bird fossils have been found. It's a very small owl species, about the same size as the little owl of today, which is aptly named. Um, and interestingly, um, in some specimens, the feathers are preserved, and it seems to have these like odd feathers on its back that are sort of like ribbon like filaments uh which, which people have interpreted as maybe like display feathers which would be very odd for an owl um uh, but also they could also be taphonomic so yeah hard to say we need better specimens um and then on the um Right here is a much bigger um, early owl species, is Primoptinx, also described uh, just last year. Um, it's about the size of um, uh, a modern uh, spectacled owl, which is a you know mid to large sized owl. So it's not not one of the biggest owls, but it's decently sized. Um, and Primoptinx is actually known from like a partial skeleton re representing like most of the bones um, in the skeleton. Um, so it's a it's one of the best known early owls and i only show the feet here because its feet show an or not not even the entire feet just the toes here um because its feet show a very uh interesting difference from modern owls so the innermost toes pictured here are you know the innermost toe on the foot um toes on the foot and then the toes towards the the outer you know the edges the sides of the image are the outer toes right and so if you look at the innermost toes you can see that the inner two toes on each or the inner two claws on each foot are notably bigger than the other claws in the foot where have we seen that before hmm <laughs> yeah we saw that in the accipitrids which use this raptor prey restraint method and so this seems to suggest that premoptings might have been killing prey similarly uh, to a uh, to an accipitrid and not as much uh, like a modern owl and we actually have some fossils of like you know more incomplete uh, specimens of um, eocene owl that also show similar kind of foot proportions um so it's possible that uh, these owls are representing a phase in owl evolution where they had not yet evolved to specialize on you know constricting small prey with their toes um there is a bit of the skull of a premoptinx preserved uh, but uh, it's not super complete, so it's hard to tell if there were any like adaptations to nocturnality or anything like that. There are some undescribed specimens of Eocene owls that seem to have more kind of like hawk-like skulls, and so that might suggest that these owls were still a diurnal species and they had not acquired like um, specialized nocturnal adaptations yet. But yeah, it would be nice to see those uh, specimens described eventually. Um, Still, in the meantime, we do have some pretty good um, owl fossils, fossils to look at. So one final thing I want to touch on um, on the next slide. Uh, so, of course, you know, when paleontologists find raptor fossils, we tend to be very excited, or at least those of us who are into birds are, because you, you have all these cool fossil rap <laughs> raptors in the fossil record. Um, 
But uh, raptors also contribute to our knowledge of paleontology in a sort of different way by their activities while they are alive. Um, and this is um, because raptors are often uh, bone accumulators, and so of course um, raptors tend to have preferred uh, places where they um, where they roost or where they nest. And so at these uh, locations, there will often be accumulations of the bones of their prey. So of course there are the parts that the raptors don't want and remove from the prey, um, but then there are also the parts that the raptors swallow, but then they spit up the bones later. Uh, so you might have uh, had the experience of dissecting owl pellets. Um, they will kind of uh, regurgitate mm -hmm. the undigestible parts of their prey and so um you know, when this happens you know over time you can easily accumulate a bunch of uh, bones at the bottom of a, a a perch or a nest of a raptor um and we find these accumulations in the fossil record sometimes um now uh, the picture on the left here is a modern example so a modern uh, verose eagle um and the prey remains that have accumulated down there uh, some of the skulls you see there are hyrax skulls verose eagles love to eat hyraxes um but there are also bones from birds there are bones from primates and bones from like hares um so uh, these uh, accumulations as you can imagine can be pretty informative uh regarding like uh past environments so they tell us like you know what kind of small animals were around at the time um they also tell us what kind of animals like the raptors in question like to eat and uh, they also they can also tell us potentially things about the environment like oh you know, you know we find species that prefer a certain kind of environment over another um that can be very helpful and uh, of course um small animals uh, can can be the remains of small animals can be very easily destroyed uh, through taphonomic processes so to be able to find like such a huge collection of them is a pretty good uh, find um in fact uh, bone accumulations have told us a thing or two about human evolution and we already kind of covered this in Jones series right but uh, just to yeah. repeat it here because it, it's relevant to kind of interactions between humans and birds uh, the Tong child uh, the type specimen of Australopithecus africanus was found in a bone accumulation that was likely produced by a large eagle uh, probably closely related or similar to the crowned eagle of Africa today which specializes in hunting um, primates um, now, uh, the evidence for this is uh, based on both the size of the prey items in the in the assemblage. So we don't see like any really large uh, prey animals. So that seems unlikely that a large carnivorous mammal produced the bone accumulation. And in addition, there are also like marks directly on this uh, skull of this baby uh, Australopithecus that uh, show, uh, you know, beak marks that, that are likely made by beak marks from, a, from an eagle. And we see similar feeding traces when we look at uh, monkeys today that have been eaten by, uh, by eagles. So, yeah, um, you know, even though today uh, we are most generally too large for any of the um, raptorial birds to see as prey, thankfully, um, that hasn't always been the case uh, back in our uh, stem human times. We had to fear these uh, know apex uh, predatory theropods um so that's kind of a, a very interesting bit of a shared history that we've had with them oh yeah it's kind of funny that you know there's all those classic movies of like cavemen mm -hmm. hunting dinosaurs or having to run from dinosaurs right. trying to eat them when we had basically the real thing right. all along <laughs> we kind of did we kind of did <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, finally on the next slide, I just show kind of the general phylogeny of Teleraves again, but uh, with a bit more detail regarding the uh, accipitra forms and their relatives. Um, so yeah, New World vultures are closely related to accipitra forms, uh, which include the secretary birds, ospreys, and accipitrids, and together the group containing New World vultures and um, accipitra forms are uh, is often called uh, accipitra morphs. Um, and of course, we also covered the owls today. Um, so there are two more groups of uh, Teleravians um, that we haven't covered. Uh, one is the Caracimorphs and one the Australavians. The Caracimorphs include the Kingfishers and Woodpeckers and more, and Australavians include uh, Seriemas and Falcons and Parrots and Songbirds and their relatives. Well, the Australavians are a more diverse group than the Caracimorphs, so I think we'll start with the Caracimorphs in the next episode. And so next time on Dinosaurs the Second Chapter, we'll start looking at the Caracimorphs, and in particular at these three groups pictured on the slide here. Um, I think these three groups are groups of birds that most people will not be familiar with. Uh, so if you recognize them on site, then uh, good job, give yourself a, a gold star and a bird nerd card. Um, 
but uh, they have very interesting things to tell us about what the world used to be like. Um, and with that enigmatic note, I will uh, uh, leave it for now. Um, Acknowledgements, uh, as always, uh, our friends Henry and Alicia had their contributions to this episode. And of course, I would like to thank uh, Sanchez Art for um, allowing me to use his uh, lovely scale chart of the Gargano uh, paleo fauna. And uh, if you enjoyed the show, you can follow us on Twitter uh, to keep up with our updates and follow our YouTube channel uh, to keep up with our updates directly. Um, you can email us with questions or leave comments on our videos because we love receiving those. And um, you know, as always, I will put uh, links to references uh, in the description. Now, um, what's next? Uh, I believe we're going back to your series. That's right. Um, it'll be part 10 of Humanity of Prologue, mm -hmm. where we talk about sort of life after the last glacial maximum and the, the rise of sedentary societies prior to the development of agriculture in various parts of the world. Excellent. All right. So looking forward to that. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Oh, I am just a poor bird, and my story seldom told, for they say that vultures have no virtues to behold. And no one wants to hear about a bird that eats carcasses of roadkill dogs and deer. They'd rather hear about a meadowlark because they're pretty and they sing. Winter's over, spring is here. Ugh. Na na na. Na 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 na. But I can soar higher than an eagle, and I got good eyes. I can spot a dead beagle by the side of the road from a mile or two away. And I can smell dead and rotting meat from at least as far away as I can see it. And if I have to eat dead meat, so be it. They say that I am ugly cause my head is bald and red, but no feathers makes it better when I'm sticking it in something that is dead. And they say I'm barbarian because I eat carrion. It's enough to make you a vegetarian. Na 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 na. But I can soar higher than an eagle, and I got. Good eyes, I can spot a dead beagle by the side of the road from a mile or two away. And I can smell dead and rotting meat from at least as far away as I can see it. And if I have to eat dead meat, so be it. You know there's nothing edible my stomach can't digest, yet they say that I'm primitive cause I don't build a nest. I lay a pair of eggs on the ledge of a high cliff or on the ground among some rocks and sticks. My mate and I, we share the incubation chores and in a month we have our pair of chicks. Na 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 But I can soar higher than an eagle and I got good eyes I can spot a dead beagle by the side of the road from a mile or two away And I can smell dead and rotting meat from at least as far away as I can see it. And if I have to eat dead meat, so be it. They say that I'm disgusting cause I vomit in defense and... Well, I don't care what they say. As long as I can be wild and free. Riding those thermal columns of warm air high into the sky, where I soar on my six-foot wingspan, forming a shallow V-shaped dihedral. 
and I hardly ever have to flap. Yes, I can soar higher than an eagle, and I got good eyes. I can spot a dead beagle by the side of the road from a mile or two away. And I can smell dead and rotting meat from at least as far away as I can see it. And if I have to eat dead meat, so be it.